Good evening and welcome to the All Candidates Debate. I'm Michael Kocheff, President of your Chamber of Commerce. I will be the moderator for today's um, event. Our timekeepers here in the front are Suzanne Rankin, our CEO, and Brittany Vandenbrink, our Policy and Communications Coordinator. We are pleased to introduce our municipal candidates tonight and to have them answer questions for you in advance of the election on October 24th of this month, of course of this month. We'd like to thank Becky from Rogers TV who is here taping tonight's session and a thank you to Bears Butchery and Catering who has provided water, tea and refreshments for this evening. They're along the side here and please free feel, to, feel free to help yourself. We asked our chamber membership to submit questions for this evening's debate. We will start with two of those questions and then we'll open it up to the audience for questions after that. If you're unable, because there's lots of people here, to answer, to have a question answered, please feel free to stay behind and ask the, uh, the candidate directly. Or uh, if you visit the town's website, you can obtain their contact information and ask them that way. As a chamber, we appreciate all of these quality candidates putting their names forward for election here in Tilsonburg. It's a great sign for our growing community. In particular, we want to thank them for taking time away from family or work life this evening to detail for us their vision for this town. We have two mayoral candidates, Stephen Molnar and Deb Gilvesi, who are seated at the front here. And we have 13 councillor candidates in the rear. We have Max Adam, Cindy Allen, Dave Bears, Barbara Bleck, Michael Hawley, Pete Luciani, Chris Parker, Bob Parsons, Chrissy Rosehart, Marcel Rosehart, Kelly Spencer, Cedric Tomiko, and Marianne Van Gertrude. We have a lot of candidates this evening, 13 candidates for councillor, two for mayor. So we ask you as the audience and the candidates to help us adhere to our timeframes. We want to give everyone a fair chance to be heard. We're going to do our best to allow community questions from the microphone, but with 13 candidates in the councillor session, it just might not be possible to hear more than one or two, unfortunately. If you do manage to get to the microphone, we ask that you keep it short and to the point and make it a good question for everyone. In terms of tonight's format, um, the candidates will be asked to speak in alphabetical order and then after that in reverse alphabetical order. With the mayoral part of the evening, we'll start um, with an opening statement from Stephen and Deb. They'll each be given three minutes for that introductory statement. We'll then move to the two questions that we have from the chamber, and there'll be three minutes to answer each question. And then we'll move to questions from you, the audience. And then we'll allow them two minutes for closing remarks. We'll take a 10 minute break uh, between the mayors and the councillor candidates. Um, to set up the stage for the councillors and you'll have an opportunity to have the water tea off to the side here. And then we'll move into the councillor session. Each councillor candidate will be given two minutes for introductory remarks. We'll then allow them questions, or three minutes for each question from the chamber, and there's two of those. And then we'll move into questions from the audience. And again, we're hoping to get there and hear as much from you as we can, but it, it just may not be possible given the number. And then each candidate will be given one minute to uh, provide closing statements. And in terms of the candidates, if there's a question you do not wish to answer, then you can simply decline to answer it. Our timers at the front here, Suzanne and Brittany, will stand up when you have 30 seconds left. And I'll say at that point in time that you have 30 seconds left. When there's 10 seconds left, um, they will put up a hand at that point in time, and I'll say so as well. And when you're done, they'll cross their arms and I'll say that you're done. <laughs> the timing format will be followed uh, in both the mayor and councillor session parts of the night. I wish you all the best of luck tonight and thank you for participating. So, starting with Deb, your opening statements and then going to Stephen after that. Before I start, does, is this automatically on? Yes. Okay, can, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Great. I am pretty loud. Good evening, everyone, and thank you to the Chamber for hosting this event and to Michael for facilitating. Who am I? I'm a mother, I'm a wife, I'm a daughter, and I'm a proud DD to my two granddaughters. I was raised on a farm just outside of Tilsimer. In 2012, my husband and I sold our farm, settled into town to pursue the running of businesses in Ingersoll and Tilsimer. I sat on many related industry boards, which involved involved government lobbying relations at all levels. 
Over the last four years, I've also done some private consulting work. Volunteer work. The gym was my home for over 20 years. I coached girls basketball at various schools, rep, team, rep teams, youth basketball, and I was active on the PTAs at Annandale and Glendale. Snack and reading programs also found its way into my schedule. I also was a member of the Economic Advisory Committee prior to being elected to council. Due to the limited time, I'm going to dive into the number one concerns that citizens have brought forth during this campaign period, and that is rapid growth. The strategic plan states that the town of Tilsonburg will accommodate and support sustainable growth. Sustainability has to ensure a balance between economic growth, environmental care, and social well-being. Economic growth. Currently, the downtown core has a 1.4% vacancy rate, which is very low. A vision to reimagine some of the downtown core to accommodate more services, commercial, and retail space must be prioritized. The town and the BIA need to work in tandem with one another to bring these new attractions to fruition. Environmental care. I brought forth a motion passed by all of council that now requires the developer to plant a tree per lot. This is not enough. We should be demanding more in preserving open space that we will never get back. When a planning application comes forward, staff makes a recommendation to either accept a park or cash in lieu of a park. Cash in lieu of a park should simply be eliminated. Green space could come in different forms, such as parkettes, treed buffer berms, or larger traditional parks. Existing parkland must be protected to ensure that it is never divided and developed. Social well-being. Inquiries have been made about indoor walking trails, rollerblading, pickleball, ther a therapeutic pool, and enhanced culture and arts. Existing infrastructure must also be maintained and the rest of the facility, this facility will need improvements. Policing service delivery review will get underway in Q4. In the future, I expect to, at some point, see a request for a fire master plan. Taxes will not support everything. Council will have to prioritize. The upcoming transportation master plan will lay out a course for a truck route and will identify traffic safety measures to be put in place. In conclusion, these are just a few concerns. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you, Michael, and I'd like to uh, thank and recognize the local chamber for facilitating this opportunity for enhanced public engagement, and to all the residents in attendance this evening who continue to demonstrate that you truly care for our community. Now, I was born, raised, and considered a privilege to live in Tilsonburg with my wife. This is an extremely important municipal election, and the future opportunities we can continue to realize together will require the continuity of responsible, experienced, and knowledgeable leadership, a positive approach to building sustainable partnerships, and an absolute commitment to the goals contained in our community strategic plan. The partnerships that I have developed through trust and respect with important provincial ministers will continue to provide direct access to accelerate important local opportunities, such as affordable housing, health care, economic development, transportation initiatives, and community safety. Now, my decision to seek re-election to the position of mayor is based on my years of experience and my personal commitment to each and every one of you that I will once again accept the responsibility with all the time and the energy that I've demonstrated in the past. Now, most of my focus remains on delivering on what is your community strategic plan. This is not my plan, this is your plan. A roadmap is authored in large part by the women, the men, and the stakeholders of Tilson. Important to share this as a, in its entirety as a benchmark for all of our shared goals and objectives. And I would quote, our vision for Tilsonburg is to grow a vibrant and engaged community built on partnerships and entrepreneurial spirit. The vision includes diverse housing, employment options, modern amenities, and sustainable growth that remains true to our culture and our heritage, and positions the community as a regional center. This vision and the goals and objectives we share will continue to be our guiding focus and will provide the foundation for responses to your questions this evening. So with continuous improvement, we will remain a municipality where the realities of economic prosperity are fostered in 
the activities of strengthening commercial corridor and an inviting network of social, cultural, and recreational opportunities for all our citizens. I have demonstrated with keen results an understanding of the dynamics involved in a regional and provincial structure while focusing firmly on the concerns of Tilsonburg and our residents. For the past eight years, we have seen aggressive local agenda only surpassed by the identifiable results. For identified and record development in all sectors of construction to sustainable and accessible transit system to Ten additional seconds. primary care providers and enhanced health care options to new job opportunities. All of these in, as contained in your community strategic plan. So for further information that's not provided in the limited time, please visit MolnerForMayor.com and thanks again for Thank being you. here this evening. Thank you. So the, the first question this evening from the chamber membership has to do with leadership. Our business community has told us that strong leadership is imperative for a town, for a growing town like Tilsonburg, and that our leaders should work towards a sustainable vision for Tilsonburg. Please describe your leadership style and how you would demonstrate leadership if elected to the position of mayor of Tilsonburg. Stephen, you would start. Excuse me, and thanks again, Michael. So my strength is really based on selling the town of Tilsonburg and all the qualities and the attributes that make it a tremendous place to live, work, play, invest, and retire in. It's about trusting others that have supported my leadership over the last 15 years that I've been proud to serve this community and rely on their historical opinion. However, to answer a few questions, I strive to maintain an inclusive and positive leadership approach based on building these partnerships through trust and respect. You know, understanding that a mayor is not an autocratic position. It, the individual has one vote of seven when council makes a decision. However, effective leadership is required for guidance and support for the open and ongoing transparent public engagement process. See, leadership's also important in demonstrating an outstanding, an, uh, an understanding, excuse me, of valuable background information, like the Municipal Act, like the Planning Act, like the Development Charges Act, the official plan, and yes, indeed, even the Emergency Management and Civil Protection Act. These are background information that may sound boring, but they're absolutely critical to the foundation of good decision-making in our community. So now is an important time for positive leadership and proven continuity. I'm very pleased to understand to the benefit of this community over the last few years to have developed personal, strong, and positive relationships with a number of provincial ministers for personal contact that are providing valuable um, results for all our community members and stakeholders the Solicitor General, the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade, the Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks, the Minister of Health, the Minister of Long-Term Care, the Minister of Infrastructure, the Minister of Labor, and the fact that the Minister of Transportation reached out to me personally to see can I or can you please sit with me on the Southwestern Ontario's Regional Master Transportation Plan. So when we look at some of the challenges that our growth is bringing to our municipality, I'm prepared to accept those challenges and turn them indeed into opportunities, not just because of the fabric and the background of the people in this community, but because of the positive relationships that I've been able to develop because of trust, because of respect, and because together we are building a community that will be maintained as, as connected and rich. 30 and seconds. <laughs> I have five key pillars, pillars to my leadership style. Number one, honesty and integrity. I was raised by hardworking parents who instilled values such as put in an honest day work and get an honest day's pay. I have carried these core values through my work practices in this term of council. My family reminds me to stay true to those values as they form the guiding principle and decisions that need to be made. Two, communication. It needs to be improved internally and ex externally. If elected, my goal would be to work with council and communications to develop new strategies to share information with the community. 
An example of this would be coffee break with a counselor, which could see council members rotate through a monthly basis doing a video to provide updates, maybe engaging TV, radio, and social media to share this format. Potentially a council e-blast is another format that should be explored. Communication also extends beyond our borders and involves forging relationships with upper tiers of government. I have had training on previous boards to bring forth that messaging on point, precise, and effective. I pledge to represent you with professionalism and pride. Three, accountability and transparency. Council is a gatekeeper of your tax dollars. Tax dollars need to be spent efficiently and effectively while maintaining roads and infrastructure. Amenities and services must be assessed to ensure the demand is being met. Pressure on the upcoming budget will be caused by inflation, labor and supply chain shortages. It is imperative more than ever that you elect a team who is creative and thinks outside the box. Budgets are guided through the core principles found in the community strategic plan. However, council still must be able to identify wants versus needs. At times it requires strong leadership to stand up and say no. Four, accessibility. Municipal government is the grassroots of all government. I am easy to approach and responsive in a timely manner. My door is always open to you. To council members, I would be accessible and available to help in any way I can, especially to those who are new. There is a learning curve and every bit of support and encouragement by an effective leader will help, help them to flourish in their new role. Finally, the most important, teamwork. Teamwork is the absolute most important quality and, and stems from my years of coaching. There is no I in team. The election seconds. is about collectively working together for the betterment of the community. From volunteers, employees, fellow council members and committees, council should respect and welcome diverse thoughts and healthy debate. Thank you. second question for the membership is that we've identified as a chamber six key priorities for the incoming mayor and council. One of them is leadership, which we've just talked about. The five others are attraction of talent to meet our growing labor demands, reduction of red tape, in particular building permit time lags, building affordable housing, engaging the business community in the policy making process, and access to doctors. If you look at those priorities, underlying all of them is one theme. We've experienced amazing growth as a community over these past years. The challenge now is how to manage all of that growth. As a mayor, how do you propose we go about managing the amazing growth that we've had in this community? Please give specific plan, examples of your plans where it is possible. We know it's not possible in the three minutes to address all five of the Chamber's priorities. However, if you can hit on them, it's appreciated. Or if you want to address the answer in a more broad way, that's fine as well. And we'll start with Deb on this one. Number one and three, attach, attraction of talent and affordable housing. Attraction of talent is a multifaceted approach that combine the following. Affordable housing and assessing amenities, infrastructure and services. Tilsonburg has a lack of affordable housing for working age people. Accessory dwellings and basement apartments do create more affordable living options and this is underway. Land has been identified for a future housing project and an individual once brought a plan to council that built housing that is 30% less market rate and targets working individuals. In fact, you have to be a working individual to um, qualify for this type of housing. I believe this model of housing should be investigated further and brought back to the table. Amenities, infrastructure and services attract working people. A, a reimagine of the downtown core to free space to accommodate enhanced shopping, more commercial space and additional, additional services are required. Municipal red tape, number two. Who better to answer this question than developers? So I reached out to a few. On the residential side, developers have told me the building department and local planner have been simply fantastic. The rapid growth and quick build out of the subdivisions is proof positive. Using cloud permit, a single application can be reviewed and approved in seven to 15 days. The industrial side is another story. 
It took over a decade to complete the first phase of the Van Norman Industrial Park. The MTO and legal issues played roles in the delay. In this one instance, I would support to hire a project manager with development exper expertise to complete the build out of the next phase in an extremely aggressive manner. Number three, engaging the business community. Partnerships and teamwork create better policy. Engagement through surveys, getting boots on the ground, having conversations to, to ensure those poli policies are beneficial is absolutely crucial. Having a business background allows me to understand the challenges business face at all levels of government. I do applaud our local businesses for their creativity and perseverance during the most recent challenging time. Four, healthcare. Currently over 2,400 individuals in town are without a primary healthcare provider. The town can help facilitate applications and must lobby upper tiers for more support. Council needs to have more interaction with local healthcare. The, the Physician Recruitment Committee has attracted doctors to our local seconds. hospital, but recently have expanded their discussions to include general practices and a medical clinic. The Ingersoll nurse practitioners have applied to Ontario Health, if successful, would take 3,200 patients. If that is successful, the first thing the town needs to ask is, what can we do to expedite this facility? Thank you. Well, finally, uh, again, thanks very much, Michael. Um, I think it's important to reflect on the, the priorities as indicated, and that inside all of those challenges uh, remain significant opportunities. Um, and need to recognize the valuable contributions uh, that we continue to receive by the local chamber, um, our own economic development advisory committee, and indeed the BIA as well. Uh, recently, uh, support uh, at the county level regarding the water and wastewater service delivery review, uh, the support from various um, members across the community in the business environment for the mayor's pandemic relief task force that did provide relief and opportunity, not just in the short term, but is still providing value to uh, businesses across Tilsonburg and the region. And the opportunity for continued partnered advocacy on provincial issues. One priority to include, and I do uh, want to concur uh, with uh, Councillor Govese, is um, regarding uh, affordable and accessible housing and the comment regarding uh, the planning department here in the town of Tilsonburg. There was text in the questions. Um, I respect uh, the messaging behind it, but um, the documentation and the endorsements and the, certainly the uh, reinforcement of how it is to do business. Um, people do business in Tilsonburg because it's a great place to do business. And at the root of that are the people in our uh, various planning and uh, building departments. So I would uh, publicly like to recognize the work they do in partnership with the developers and the industry in our community. Uh, I've just focused briefly. There's a lot of information there. I would encourage actually uh, the residents to maybe follow up on some of the things that they didn't hear regarding the five priorities as outlined by the chamber. But I'm going to focus um, a little bit in summary on an item that uh, is not a municipal responsibility. And um, the province is responsible for health care. And uh, ultimately, it's my number one priority. We can fix a bridge, we can build a road, we can do a lot of things for infrastructure, we can utilize the growth we've had and that growth pays for growth to not impact and to further actually mitigate any tax increases on the residents of the town of Tilsonburg. We've done a great job of water and 30 wastewater. seconds. So quickly in 30 seconds for something that will be initiated first upon any re-election will be the Mayor's Task Force on Sustainable Health Care, which is identifying what we currently have available locally, celebrating what we have available locally, and then to the table as already committed, a representative of TDMH, family physician, retired nurse, a nurse practitioner from that same clinic who's got my personal endorsement, past chair of the TDMH, a Health Force Ontario. Sorry, that's all the time uh, we have. Chair of the physician recruitment, that is an initiative that needs the uh, support of the entire community. Thanks very much.
those are the, the two chamber questions that we have for the mayors this evening. So if there's anybody in the audience that wants to ask a question, there's a microphone right up here at the front. And it's the, the same format um, that uh, both of them will have three minutes to answer the question. I would hope that everyone running, including the uh, people for council, would agree that the most important decisions that are made are for the health and welfare, namely the safety of the citizens and residents of the town of Tilsonburg. If you disagree with that, please elaborate. That being said, Tilsonburg has installed PXO crossings in various locations around uh, the town. What other type of crossings were considered whether it was a different style, more of them, greater time for pedestrians to cross the road or other solutions. I have witnessed too many vehicles go through some of these crossings as I'm walking or driving in my car. Thank you very much for, in advance for your time for answering the question. Could everybody hear the question in the back? Not quite. So I, I believe if I'm stating it right, what, what is a PXO crossing? Somebody help me up front. <laughs> we, I, I can answer it. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I think we're probably either one of you or. or <laughs> okay. So the the question essentially is that uh, a certain type of crossing has been used primarily, and it there's a there's a concern that it's not working. So certain types of crossings have been used for pedestrians. The question is, what other options? Okay. So, so the question is, there's been a certain type of crossing that's been recently installed in various locations. There's a concern that it might not be working. Um, the audience members wondering what other options were considered and I'm sure um, what might be done differently in the future, if anything. And Deb, you, I believe you would be, we had Stephen last, right? I did, yeah. Yeah, so you would start That's going fine. back this way. Yeah, Go no problem. Uh, first of all, thanks very much for the question. And I know the PXOs, that's the acronym for the pedestrian crosswalks. They're a device that is pedestrian activated and um, pedestrians are to be educated that the vehicles have stopped prior to making their crossing. Um, is that a perfect situation? No, but they've been integrated successfully into the municipality to provide greater access. Primarily, uh, it originated for school crossings, uh, uh, first, you know, on Highway 19. We call it Broadway, but it's actually a provincial highway. Um, Tilson Ave, it's actually a county road. Um, but these are local initiatives as supported by senior partners to actually make uh, pedestrian uh, traffic more safe. Um, I think uh, in large part they've been endorsed by our police services board, they've been endorsed by our uh, operational and roads department, and they've been endorsed by uh, all the council. There's been concerns, and I would recognize and thank you for the question, relative is the timing uh, appropriate? Are they, uh, lights coming on uh, as soon as they should to give more warning to the vehicles um, so that the pedestrian is, is provided with a greater uh, opportunity for safety. Uh, that is something that's been heard. Is the color of the lights something that should be reviewed? Uh, there are certainly alternative mechanisms, but relative to the Ministry of Transportation and, and others that help supply the, the, uh, the, these type of devices, they've been integrated into our community to provide safety. And I think um, any review, um, I would uh, suggest as well, should be part of the anticipated master transportation plan, not across the county, but locally, where there's regional growth in, in various sectors of our community, where there's either current or potential uh, residential and, and schools being built. 
uh, this is where we should have a greater review of traffic patterns, both pedestrian and vehicular, within our community. And that goes also to the um, kind of a parallel discussion regarding uh, transportation, uh, commercial truck traffic through our downtown core. And I think that's one of the other uh, options we should be looking at. And we already started that discussion on the task force that the, the minister had invited me to participate. Thank you. Safety is job number one. Um, I've received multiple complaints about the crosswalks. So during the campaigning period, I made a point of using them, especially the one uh, at Glendale and Broadway. I think everyone will know what I'm talking about. Push the light, a car went through. I don't blame the vehicle. Um, it's you can't stop. Like, if you're close to that intersection, it blinks right away, you can't stop. A tractor trailer is not going to be able to stop. So the pedestrian, yes, does need to be aware. The lights are ill-positioned. A while back, I put a motion on the floor at council to send an information letter to the MTO that these crossings are not safe. The lights are ill-positioned. They should be overhead. You cannot see them if you're behind a transport truck. That motion failed at council. This is safety. The number one job of council to is ensure to put things in place and create policies that aid in the well-being of all the citizens of the town. I don't believe these are safe. I believe there needs to be a review, especially the one at Broadway and um, Glendale Drive where students are crossing every day and we've got a lot of traffic. Thank you. Just to follow up on that last one, what seems to work are those red light cameras? because I've been caught in a couple of them and I stop at every yellow light now. <laughs> uh, my question is kind of, it's not a specific issue. Is this even on? But it seems like today the world is in such a bizarre spot, like Bob Dylan, you know, most people in here probably recall that song he had, the times there are changing. Well, the times are changing today quicker than anyone can think of. And in fact, uh, you know, you look at the world and you wonder how it was the same world 20 years ago, because it's not the same now. Look at Ukraine, everyone, it's bizarre, it's bizarre. The Sorry. whole Putin thing is bizarre. Anyway, to bring this closer to home, I don't understand the intolerance issue that seems to haunt us, not only here across North America. But my question is intolerance and uh, lack of caring and concern for others, whether they're wearing a mask, straight, gay, whatever it is, is an ongoing issue. And in fact, the, uh, the Bank of Canada and Sorry, the- Sorry, I, I, do you have a question? Sorry, yeah, yeah. the Bank of Canada and the uh, Canadian government have both said that communities that have tolerance, show tolerance and have uh, helped people of all colors and creeds and nature get along are the most uh, prosperous communities. I know it wasn't in the chambers thing, but my question is, do you believe that Tilsonburg should move to a new section of tolerance and what do you think can be done to improve that and this question i'd also it's a simple question i i know i, I spend a lot of okay, time is it is it fair to say the question to them is how do they plan to foster tolerance during their term sure that's that, great does that work but i would also like to ask that to all the councillors too could you just write that down and ask that? <laughs> just a quick it's just it just one. depends there's 13 councillors times three is 40 so okay, it's, it's, I'd hard. Be, it's a bit I'd, harder i'd be happy to know if just if they believe we need to become more tolerant <laughs> i would well let's let's allow them to answer and we can go from there deb if you want to start um i actually feel sorry that you feel that way um, we live in an absolutely fantastic community. I see growth in diversity. 
I, I do feel somewhat that your question was an insult to the very fine citizens in this room. I believe in diversity. Diversity is growing. We live in a fantastic community, and I applaud each and every one of you who help your neighbors every day. Thank you. Stephen, if you want to go ahead. <laughs> well, you actually have to act the way you, you know. Actions speak louder than words. And I'm not going to stand in front of anyone and pretend that I'm better than anyone else. I actually think there's merit to the question because it speaks to kind of the holistic um, aspect of communities right across our country, not regarding just race and, and sexual uh, orientation and so many other things. COVID hit communities. COVID hit communities more than just the pandemic and the illness itself. It tore communities apart. It tore families apart. And that's part of the restoration that's going to be important in this community moving forward. So to the point of the question, celebrate what we have. Welcome the neighbors that are coming in from all areas of the nation. Knocking on doors, which has been an exciting and welcoming and listening to the history and the new, uh, the new people from all over Canada that are bringing new values and, and new ideas, new volunteers. That's the, that's the natural fabric. That's how this community has changed every generation. That's what's important. That's the fabric of Tilson. So regardless of the question or not liking the question, the men and women of this community, the families of this community, have always risen up. I have no doubt that that's going to continue in the future. But I think actions do speak louder than words. Thanks very much. I have two quick questions. First, do you have the demographics and percentages of the type of people who are moving into the new homes? so that you know how Tilson River needs to grow, if people moving here but still working in Hamilton or somewhere else, kids, no kids, just young families. And the second is, I know it's hard to break out of typical thinking about projects. You know, this is the way we've always done it. But in relation to housing, how as mayors, a mayor, would you be open to new thinking, like small homes or tiny homes, they call them. Things like that could allow a lot of independent people to have a place to stay, and yet you can have a large number of housing in a small area. Thank you. So for those of you who couldn't hear in the back, uh, it's a bit of a two-part question. First part about are, are you aware of the changing demographics here in town? And uh, I think it probably goes hand in hand with the second question um, in terms of alternative ways to accommodate growth. How do you feel about that? What would you do with that in the new term? He had mentioned tiny homes and secondary dwellings in particular. And, and Stephen, you'd be starting on this one. Yeah, um, excellent and, and, and a good follow up. I'm going to be, as always, uh, transparent. I do not have in front of me. Uh, the actual uh, 2021 census numbers rel related to a certain demographic patterns uh, of the town of Tilsonburg. Um, my observations uh, from again knocking on doors and standing on steps and sitting in living rooms recently have been uh, an increased diversity from various nationalities and importantly also a youthful influx of younger families people that are investing in our community as young entrepreneurs, a lot of them working at home because of the, the uh, foundation of, uh, that they're able to, to do that here. And uh, I believe um, where the gentleman went, but uh, relative to um, ARU's uh, small housing, additional footprints, additional residential units on a single property, which could be in an R1 zone, but you can have in essence, it's a modified type of granny flat. I'm just kind of paraphrasing that. Um, it was an actually uh, council um, candidate uh, and myself and the chief building official were uh, 
uh, fortunate enough to attend a tiny homes conference uh, in Ancaster recently. There's a lot of opportunities and options. And actually, it's a conversation that goes beyond just the type of housing that's available. It also goes back to the last question and the answer and recognizing that we are all in this together. And I know that saying it takes a village, but if we're really committed to providing for next generation and, 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 and welcoming uh, of, of new residents, then alternative types of housing are going to be a key part of that. Attainable housing where fully employed individuals have to be making a certain amount of money, but can't be making more than a maximum amount of money. And then developing the governance and the, um, the financial plan to ensure that those people have a, a safe and warm place to, to sleep at night as well. So I believe the two, the, your two comments did dovetail quite well uh, to each other. I appreciate the question. Deb? Um, I also don't have any statistics available, so I apologize. Um, tiny homes. The town owns 600 acres of land by the airport. This is a discussion that's already been tossed around the economic ed advisory table. Uh, rent to own is something that I feel is uh, an option that should be looked at. I actually talked to a resident who's on a rent to own program and it helps move people from one place to another. There's gonna be a lot of pressure on affordable housing with inflation. People are struggling to buy groceries, pay their bills. We see increasing carbon tax. You're, there's gonna be pressure on your home heating in the winter time. All these things add up. There's gonna be more pressure on affordable housing. So yes, I do think we should be looking at tiny homes and seriously, seriously looking at it. Rent to own, I've already talked about a form of housing that is attractive to working age people. But you know what? Probably in the last election, we had this same conversation. When are we gonna stop talking about it? And when are we going to start doing something about it? Hello. Yes. Um, I agree with Deb. Uh, with her pre. No. You got to put it Talk right, right close okay. to your mouth. Okay. Uh, Deb made an earlier comment talking about this being a fantastic community, and I certainly believe that, and have believed that for the past 40 years that I've been living in this community. However, it breaks my heart to see the level of homelessness and unhoused people in our community. I happen to work with St. Vincent de Paul, and we provide at least 50 people every month with emergency food. The greatest problem that these people have is lack of shelter, lack of housing. And so my question is specifically, can you please tell us what plans you have to bring a shelter into our town? So the, the, the question, if anybody couldn't hear it, was what plans are there to bring a shelter into town um, to support the homeless population here in Tilsonburg? And Deb, you're starting on this one. Thank you. The town, firstly, just to be clear, the town receives zero dollars for social services. So this is a challenge at the municipal level. So this message has to go to the county because the town needs support. Um, I think it was two years ago, the town didn't investigate um, opening a shelter. In fact, in this very building, I think this is the only building that would be zoned to like house something like that. Um, it's a multifaceted approach. You have to have um, counseling, you have to have security. There is a phenomenal cost to running it every day. So the town needs support. I'm being blunt about it. That help needs to come from the county. But I can assure you, there's two amazing girls that go around town in the mobile outreach bus. I don't know if you've ever seen them. 
um, simply fantastic. If I was elected, I'd actually like them to come into council to do a presentation. They came to a BIA meeting and did one, and I was literally blown away at the work that they do. I can assure you that those women have made contact with everyone that is homeless in this community. Um, so that's their job, it's outreach. So they identify them, they help them, they try and put them in shelters. Okay, there are shelters, not in this community, but in Woodstock, and I understand that. We may need to create partnerships for a local shelter to happen. But that being said, these women are simply fantastic. We also have to recognize, and I, like I hate saying this, but not everyone wants to go to a shelter. We can't force people, even the OPP, when, then, when they attend to situations, is sometimes just an information resource. The information is passed forward, but you can't force anyone to receive it. So there's multi-challenges to this problem. If it, if it could be easily solved, it would be. But this is not just in this community, and it's in every community, and it's growing. There needs to be provincial support, there needs to be county support, there needs to be partnerships. Thank you. I'll be brief on what is actually a long and, and very arduous journey to satisfying individuals that need our help. They need a help up. Um, and it's our responsibility, no matter who's, I apologize, it's on. No matter whose responsibility is, it's our responsibility. See, a caring community doesn't begin to delegate based on lines on a map or the, you know, the acts that tell you who's responsible for, for program A, B, or C. A caring community finds ways, like Andrew from St. Vincent de Paul has indicated. There are other organizations, faith-based organizations in the community that provide nourishment. As we focus on the opportunity for short-term transitional housing, the opportunity from a, a government agency well-funded in the county of Oxford is investigating eight units for the municipality currently. I'm very excited about that, but it will take some zone change potential. And going back to the last question, it'll take acceptance from community members and neighbors to understand that we are all in this together. So with Mr. Stanchak stands up and says, I'm willing to be part of the solution. And I know there's others that are willing to be part of that solution. Then I think that's the time we collectively find that made in Tilsonburg solution for people that may not even be from here but they need the help up. They need that first bit of support that will come with other support services, like the CMHA, and, and just working with uh, financial planning people that can, have they ever had a, a bank account or know how to, to make change? This isn't just about a pillow and a warm place at night. It's about life skills, cooking, diet, so many other things. And people, on the large part, just need that helping hand. And I think what I've heard tonight and what I know exists right around this community, that that solution will be found. 30 because seconds. it's going to be found because of the people in this room and around the town of Tilsonburg. Thank you. Yeah, we have time for one more question. Well, I have two observations and a concern. I've lived here nine years now. I guess I've lived here nine years now, and one of the things I've observed, and I picked up on some of the other information, speeding has become a real issue in this town. Like, and I came from big cities where pedal to the metal seemed to work for us. But when you go on the 19 here, 
I've gone 10 over the limit, and guys have passed me at 140, and that's not uncommon. And it's pretty aggressive throughout the town. With the growth that's taking place, I've actually handed out stop CAA's uh, slow down signs to people west of the, the town. And they have serious concerns about speeding. It's just very aggressive. And I wonder, because there appears to be, there doesn't appear to be a deterrent. Whereas if I drive through Cortland, I'm told, oh, you better slow down, Cortland tickets you. So this is an observation that I haven't seen much deterrent taking place on the roads when this is happening. And the last item is we're growing, the town is growing, and I'm concerned about the infrastructure to support our community. You see it in London, where now there's constant rush hour traffic. The infrastructure can't handle the growth. So those are the two things I thought I'd like to bring up and get some answers on. Thank you. Do you, do you have a preference? Because you probably only have time for, uh, well, we only have time for one. Yep. No, no, I meant a preference in terms of which oh, question we answer. No, no offense, Stephen. I can answer. I can no, answer. everybody's, well, I think we have to start with Stephen because he, yes, he left off enough. there. No, I, just, I think just being brief, we certainly visited uh, both yeah. uh, residents. It's a similar question that was shared uh, to all candidates at uh, Hickory Hills meeting. I'd also like to recognize and thank the uh, organizers of Baldwin Place, so all candidates night. Um, so whether it's speed, whether it's record, driving, whether it's uh, um, volume of traffic, um, those are all things that um, we all realize that yeah. are, are escalating. I think to be fair, the um, a lot of the comments uh, regarding Wilson Ave in Tilsonburg, there's been a 34% decrease in the amount of traffic since Concession Street has been opened again. Mm -hmm. I mean, we do have to use facts along the way. Sure. But at some point, there's an obvious um, recognition that uh, traffic in general needs to be uh, revisited regarding the entire community. Where are our growth? I mentioned it earlier. F schools, we talked about the PXOs. Those are all things. Then we have to look at traffic calming options, additional enforcement, and um, things that is just an option, but automated speed enforcement, quote unquote, photo radar that didn't exist 18, 24 months ago, but the province now provides municipalities with that as an option. There's a you know, cost to it, but there's actually revenue streams that come from it directly to the municipality. So your message, the message from other uh, identified areas within the, the community are certainly identified. I uh, know we discussed it at Police Services Board, uh, the opportunity for additional, um, you know, whether it's a traffic committee, I'd, I'd hate to get cut down in more red tape because sometimes people are, 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 are talking about vision and it gets bogged down in red tape and the accomplishment. The things that matter to you and your neighbors are not getting accomplished because we're getting caught in, in our own internal red tape. Understood, and if I just may. Well, no, sorry. We just don't okay. have time for a lot of back and forth. Thank now, you. did you want to answer the infrastructure question at all? Do we still oh. have your time going, or? I, did. <laughs> I don't know if I remember. He, he asked a question about infrastructure um, being overburdened and how we're going to handle that. You have a minute yeah. 20 left? Okay. Now, the, the infrastructure is very solid in this community. Um, the conundrum tends to be what's all this growth and the pressure on infrastructure, and then it, it's like, where can we get affordable grocery and additional retail stores? Well, growth, you know, pays for growth as far as the infrastructure. I'm very excited and, and know that. Uh, most, if not, well, actually, all our food and agri-food related um, businesses and industry in this community have invested in new technologies to mitigate their large use of water, which brings net capacity of water back to the community for, for growth and, and other opportunities for local residents. The new homes have low flow toilets, low flow, all their, you know, their uh, um, various uh, showers and, and dishwashers. So uh, a square foot of home doesn't use the water that even perhaps ours does. So uh, capacity on infrastructure is not an issue. And um, I think, uh, again, facts matter. So, but thanks very much. 
Deb. Thank you. Um, I'll start with infrastructure. The county is doing a waste uh, water and water study to determine current needs and future needs. So that's currently ongoing. I think you can speak up on the Oxford County website if you want to put your mm -hmm. um, input in. Um, and as far as other infrastructure, I think there needs to be an assessment, um, especially um, firefighting. We have fabulous volunteers, but we are growing rapidly. Um, we'll probably need a fire master plan moving forward. The traffic transportation master plan it has been prioritized in the community strategic plan. So that's brought forward from the citizens. Um, I'd like to see that plan done in 2023. Um, in it will it will identify areas of concerns where traffic calming measures are required. It's also looking at a truck route. Um, get a lot of complaints about the trucks, so we do need to look at something that's efficient to move the trucks around the community without having them all run down Broadway. Traffic calming measures. I've done some research into other communities. Um, it's great to have Tilsonburg Solutions. It's innovative, but sometimes if other communities have already done it and they've got it right, well, let's just piggyback off of that. It saves a lot of time and it saves a lot of money. Policing, Q4 of this year, I believe it was Councilor Parker and myself who put a resolution on the floor. There will be a review of policing services in Q4 of this year, so new council will be dealing with it. Um, other communities have hired a dedicated traffic officer. So all they do is attend to different areas in town for strictly traffic violations. The issue now, I have some people that sometimes reach out to me and say, you know what, the police were here, they were here for you know 10 or 15 minutes. Well, people don't realize they may have got called away on a priority call and they have to leave. Um, so I mean, I think they're trying the best that we, that we can, but I think policing services for the growing community will have to be enhanced. Thank you. Thanks. So now we'll have two minutes for each candidate to provide their closing remarks, and we'd start with Deb. Thank you. Why am I running? For you, the town, passion, and I've got a lot of energy to expel. Having been on council the last term has allowed me to grow, familiarize myself with the Municipal Act, and the very important role that council plays in each and every one of your lives. Municipal government is truly that grassroots government. It's where daily interactions with citizens, partners, groups, and volunteers occur. Over the past four years, I have demonstrated that I'm engaged. I am not afraid to ask questions. I am not afraid to carry your concerns and messages to upper tiers of government. And I am certainly not afraid to say no. Council as a whole needs to do a better job in the planning process, and that includes me. I need to do a better job. We cannot stop growth, but Council certainly has the power to mitigate its effects. We need to protect and we need to grow our green spaces, and we need more trees, a lot more trees. The budget is the most important item Council deals with on a yearly basis. As the town embarks on its first 10-year budget plan with high inflation pressures, it will take create creativity, vision, and out-of-the-box thinking to bring in a budget that will soften the effects on you, the taxpayer. 30 seconds. I pledge hard to work for you, to listen to you, and effectively make the council chamber a welcoming, welcoming environment to share your thoughts and concerns. Voting begins tomorrow. If you have not received your information, visit customer service at 10 Lisker Ave. Thank you for coming out. I ask you please Ten consider seconds. putting an X by Deb. Vote for someone who's fiscally responsible, accountable, accessible, a team player, and full of energy. Thank you. Thank you. I messed up the order on you there. My apologies. But Stephen, your closing remarks. No. You want to read mine? Re you want to read mine? <laughs> well, as I stand in front of you, my fellow residents, and ask for your support to continue our journey to advance the goals and objectives of the town of Tilsonburg, I'd rather, in my closing, not focus on me. 
I would, however, like to briefly focus on celebrating. Celebrating the incredible resiliency demonstrated by individuals and community partners over the past two years. I'd like to again thank our healthcare professionals, our emergency service personnel, and the countless essential workers who sacrificed so much and guided us through the challenges we have faced both individually and collectively, and for the value and hope that they maintain for us on a daily basis. So to conclude, I continue to encourage your questions and concerns, and yes, I love ideas and suggestions over the next few days. But this journey doesn't stop. It's not a six-week campaign to build a community. It's a four-year commitment, a commitment that's been made in the past and will be made again. It's based on respect, and it's based on trust, and it's based on a commitment to each and every one of you that if you reach out and you ask and you need to be contacted, you will get a response. Facilitation is management, it's leadership. Not doing staff's job. 30 seconds. For additional information, I would ask you to access my homepage at molnerformayor.com. And to summarize, this election is not about change. It's about continuous improvement, and it is about a choice. I would ask that you consider Molnar for Mayor the choice for your future. Ten seconds. Thanks again to the Chamber and all those in attendance this evening. And please, stay safe. Okay, so we'll start with the second half of the evening now, which is our candidates for councillor. And we have 13 of them up at the front here. And I'll just uh, read off their names once again. So we have, starting from this side here, going over to the far side, we have Max Adam, Cindy Allen, it's Dave Barris. Dave. Barris? Dave Barris. Barris? Okay. Okay, I think I've got it right. I should have just had them do their own names. Um, Barbara Black, Michael Hawley, Pete Luciani, Chris Parker, Bob Parsons, Christy Rosehart, Marcel Rosehart, Kelly Spencer, Cedric Tomiko, and Mary Ann Van Gertrude. And again, the, the second half of the evening is two minutes for each candidate for their opening statement. And then we'll have the two questions from the chamber and they'll all have three minutes on those. Then we'll go into questions from the audience if we have time at that point in time. And uh, at the very end, we'll have one minute for each uh, candidate to make a closing statement coming back the other way. So I'll just ask that we start at the, the far end here by me with Max Adam. You hear me, Michael? Okay. Thank you, Michael, for the introduction, and thank you to Suzanne and the Chamber for the invitation to be here today, and lastly, to everyone out in the audience and watching later from home. Uh, my name is Maxwell Adam. I'm 37 years old. I'm a husband and father of three to three boys, ages eight, three, and one, eight, four, and one, sorry. Uh, they are Emerson, Isaiah, and Elias. Uh, they are the number ones in my world. Uh, both sides of my family hail from Norwich Township. My father's side was, uh, they were tobacco farmers for three generations, and then my mom's side was uh, north of uh, Norwich, near Burgessville. They were dairy farmers. And uh, yeah, my mom recently shared some history with me. It was a letter from the War of 1812 to my great-great-granddad, great-great-great-granddad, and it was just saying, like, thanks for stepping up in a, in a certain role. And so just talking about some of uh, my family history here, and I'm going to touch on about new people in Tilsonburg, too, a little later. Uh, so speaking about history, currently I'm working as a full-time teacher in London, Ontario at B. Davison Secondary School. It's a uh, uh, it's a unique school. The reasons are because uh, there's no academic or applied there, and it's just an all vo it's a vocational school, so all workplace level. So uh, the second thing that's unique about it is all the students have individual education plans or IEPs, so they're dealing with some sort of uh, uh, struggle with learning for one reason or another, whether they have uh, autism spectrum disorder, ADHD, uh, anxiety issues, and these students also have low li literacy rates. And uh, there's also a sizable LGBTQ2 population at our school. 
30 seconds? My goodness. OK. Well, anyways, uh, I just, I'm going to talk about uh, some hot topics for me this election. Uh, I'm kind of caught off guard here. So lower taxes and debt repayment. I've been on uh, town council before from 2014, 2018. Uh, and yeah, I'm hoping I, I'm able to <laughs> talk about some more things. But 10 we'll seconds. And Cindy Allen we have next. Hello, can you hear me back there? Perfect. So my name is Cindy Allen, and I'm asking for your vote to be one of six town councillors in Tilsonburg. Some may not recognize my name, but may recognize me from working the last two federal elections out of Hickory Hills and or working out of a local optometry clinic, shopping in town or enjoying our parks. Here is how I'm improving our community as a volunteer. I am the chair of the Tilsonburg Accessibility Advisory Committee to Council. This, co this committee makes recommendations on the facilities, outdoor areas, and services we provide to our community, community, ensuring that they are accessible for all. I was also nominated as vice chair of the Tilsonburg Transit Advisory Committee to Council. Currently, I'm filling in the chair role for the remainder of the term. This committee focuses on providing in-town and out-of-town transit bus service to our community. I am also a parent volunteer with a local elementary school. Over the years, I have read to kindergarten students, been a member of parent council, playground fundraising committee, nutritional stack, snack volunteer, among other roles. My background is supporting people with disab developmental disabilities and mental health, working within a not-for-profit agency. This is important for staying on budget. I did not use lawn signs for my campaign. I donated to the food bank instead because that was a better use of money. My platform includes bringing a nurse practitioner-led clinic to town, sustainable 30 growth, seconds. having a health check on our services, and of course, affordability. You have six votes for councillor. Please include Cindy Allen as one of your votes to bring my strengths and abilities to represent our community. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Dave, you're next. My name is Dave Barris, and I've served Tilsonburg with seven terms of council, being mayor, deputy mayor, and councillor. I was mayor for a six-month period. I owned a Main Street business for more than four decades, which kept my thumb on the pulse of the community on a regular basis. I've recently retired, and since then, I've had more time to dedicate to my municipal duties. My community service includes uh, many years with the Lions Club, and I've served with the Royal Canadian Legion. Uh, my adult children, I have three adult children living here in town, and four teenage grandchildren all living here in town, and we usually host Sunday dinner at our house. And these people are keeping me current on what the activities are in the community on a regular basis. Uh, mostly with sports and with, uh, with business. Um, I'm certainly aware of the growth that we're experiencing in the community, and we need to adjust for that growth. I'm going to give the rest of my minutes up, Michael. That's what I have for my introduction. Thank you. We have Barbara Black next. Do I have, do I have to turn on? Hello. Just close. Okay, so Swallow I'll the mic. I've got short legs. <laughs> Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Just get closer. Hello. Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, wow. I got short legs. All right. Okay. My name is Barb Black. I was born in Kitchener, but raised in a small town called Zurich, uh, capital of the Bean Festival. My mother was a big supporter of many groups, and I had the opportunity to go with her on uh, many occasions to sit and listen. I then went to London, and uh, my journey began uh, at a younger age. I was there for 27 years. I sat on many committees, one being London Housing. I learned a lot being involved in many programs for the children, less fortunate, and worked with the elderly. Uh, after I, I then left, I then left and went to St. Thomas. And um, I did a lot of uh, fundraising there. Um, I actually created um, a fundraising thing called Kids Count Too because I felt that kids needed to be part of our community too and, uh, and growth in our community. Um, so I was there for uh, 10 years. Then I went to um, 
Uh, Port Stanley, Ontario. Um, I had a condo on the beach, but I had the Wharf Restaurant in Port Stanley. If everybody knows the Wharf Restaurant in Port Stanley. Um, I then um, created a committee for the Stork Club because I wanted to bring the memories back of the Stork Club. If anybody here remembers the Stork Club um, in, in Port Stanley. So um, I involved myself in the theatre there. Um, I helped them do many fundraisers there to expand their theatre down there. Um, uh, all I can say is that I've sat on many, many committees. Um, I've done lots of fundraising. I'm, um, I like to take late, uh, major leadership roles in the community. 30 I have seconds. a sense of responsibility and dependability. I'm able to take on any concerns and ideas from concept to completion using my skills. I would love to have the opportunity to apply my skills to many things that need to be addressed in this community. Thank you. Next we have Michael Hawley. Thank you, Michael. The question I got asked when I told people I was running for council was really, aren't you busy enough? I never really considered that, but there is some truth to that question. I own and operate a fuel tax recovery company in Tilsonburg for the last 23 years. I have been in the environmentalist industry for over 30. I'm the financial secretary of the Tilsonburg Knights of Columbus going into my 20, 27th year there own and operate the Tillsburg Thunder Hockey Club in our 15th year, two championships. I've run the last seven rib fests, and last, but certainly not least, have a wife, seven kids, and five grandchildren to keep happy too. But I've always believed if you want to get something done, you give it to a busy person. And I guess if that's really the story of my career, I get things done. I'm not going into every detail of my platform, and I'm sure the questions will bring them out, but there's a couple of themes I want to short, focus on in these short few minutes. At least 50% of household waste is organic material. A green bin program will help keep the waste out of our landfill by collecting organic material and turning it to compost that can be given and sold back to the people of Tilsonburg. I want to make the t town easier to deal with, especially in the acquisition of permits. People want to know what they need to do to get the permit, and the process should be much easier than it is. People of Tilsonburg are the town's customers and need to be treated that way. Expansion of Tilsburg is on everyone's mind. In my business, I deal with many municipalities across the province. A lot of them have a lot of really good ideas which we need to bring back and put on it as a Tilsburg solution. A theme of com that is common in expanding communities is that there are two camps of citizens. The ones that have been here for a while, they want to see more people come. Because as more people come, they, they bring seconds. more services, like Wild Wings and um, Starbucks, for example. People that basically move here don't want to see anybody else come because they move from a small town to a big town. Getting the transports off Broadways will be, certainly help that solution, and we need to develop a truck route around there to go. I only have a couple seconds left, so Kingsley Bridge is a big topic. I Ten support seconds. that. Uh, we need to communicate communication from the council to the people. I committed to writing a column in the Wednesday paper to, to tell you what's going on in, in council. I hope my experiences will and I beat them. That's it. Thank you. Luciani. Good evening, and thank you for your interest in this election. I am retired, having spent 33 years with the OPP, which gave me the opportunity to live and visit in a lot of areas of this province. There is no doubt in my mind, Tilsonburg is a great town. My wife Kelly and I share six adult children and 11 grandchildren, and we chose to live out our retirement here due to the quality of life that Tilsonburg provides. I am grateful to have had the opportunity to be voted in as one of your councillors during this past term. It has been a unique term due to COVID, but all in all, I believe it was a fairly successful term. Did we please everyone? No, but I do believe we, and I say we, as I am but one vote, did move things in a positive direction. My platform remains similar to my previous one. Maintain, look after what we have, infrastructure, programs, relationships. Build, keep a focus on both industrial and residential growth and ensure it is sustainable and enhance. Reevaluate programs when needed and support the beautification of our downtown Lake Lisger in our parks. Tilsonburg's recently completed 10 year community strategic plan provides a framework going forward. With that in mind, some of what I support. A walk-in clinic and or a nurse practitioner and anything to take pressure off our hospital. Sustainable growth long-term beds and senior continuum of care, intercommunity and in-town transit, a transportation master plan, 
keeping green space and uh, trails, evaluating seconds. emergency services in light of current and future growth, senior and affordable housing, pickleball courts, uh, completion of the water park and change rooms, development of additional industrial lands, the best decision for our, the future of our town hall, supporting the BIA to continue enhancing our downtown, exploring beautification of Bridge Street, replacement or, or rehabilitation of the Kinsley Pedestrian Bridge. I want to close by acknowledging the contribution of every staff member of the town of Tilsonburg. They are the true custodians of our quality of life. Thank you. Thank you. Chris Parker. First off, I'd like to thank Michael, Suzanne, and the Chamber of Commerce for the opportunity to speak here tonight. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Chris Parker, and I'm seeking re-election to council this year. I am a lifelong resident of Tilsonburg. I'm happily married to my wife, Rebecca, of six years. Uh, we don't have any children, but we do have a dog named Teddy. He's a sheep -a doodle and he's a huge part of our family. I'm currently the refereeing chief for Tilsonburg Minor Hockey and the president of the Tilsonburg Men's Slow Pitch League. I'm the chair of the town's Recreation and Sports Advisory Committee, as well as the chair of the Affordable and Attainable Housing Committee. I'm also a board member for Tilsonburg Nonprofit Housing, which looked at, looks after affordable seniors' housing in town. If re-elected over the next four years, I have four main areas of focus. Community safety, traffic, impacts of development on existing neighborhoods, and youth engagement. The first, community safety. Our population has grown so much, we've not added any police officers to keep up with the growth. We need a full review of our police services and a safety review of the current pedestrian crosswalks on Broadway and Quarter Town Line. Also, along the same lines of community safety, we need to create a transportation master plan to review traffic congestion and speed. This could also address the issue of transport trucks in the downtown, with the possible creation of a truck route. I also believe that we need to create a traffic advisory committee. Development is something that the town is not being able to avoid. We need to ensure that we have the proper infrastructure in place to continue to progress the town. We also need to ensure that our buildings, bridges, roads are being maintained. With new development, we need to make sure that the new development has minimal impacts on current residential neighborhoods. Youth engagement, a common concern of residents in our, in our community is that there's nothing for children to do. However, a creation of a youth council will allow for us to engage the youth of our community Ten to seconds. see where services are lacking and what we can add to our current programming. This will also help to develop our leaders of the future by involving them in current town decisions. Thank you. Thank you. Bob Parsons. Thank you, Chamber. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for coming. As your representative on town council, I will have the responsibility to act, to influence, to disrupt, and seek out new solutions and partnerships to ensure Tilsonburg will be the best community to live, work, play, raise a family, and retire. I believe my gen agenda represents a path forward to ensure Tilsonburg remains the community of choice. I seek to be one voice on council, and I will use my council vote to work for and on behalf of all Tilsonburg residents. These are the cornerstones of my agenda. Fiscal responsibility, strategic planning, health care, public safety, and communications. These five cornerstones include more than 20 action plans which I will begin working on as soon as I'm elected. For example, two issues include housing and jobs. Young families are living with their parents. A working single person cannot afford to rent a one-bedroom apartment in Tilsonburg. I want to encourage our builders to address this problem through targeted incentives to build homes that are smaller, energy efficient, and faster to build. Other municipalities in Ontario have modified building codes and zoning requirements to allow for alternative housing communities. We can leverage the experience and lessons learned to identify possible solutions and viable options in Tilsonburg. There is a shortage of serviced industrial land in inventory and, and a shortage of employment opportunities for young adults. I want to invest in a new business park that will provide opportunities for a mix of commerce, light industry, and innovation facilities creating well-paying jobs and opportunities for young entrepreneurs. I invite you to take a copy of my election platform or I will be glad Ten to seconds. send you one in the email. I have some copies in the back. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone need their mic loosened to be closer to them? 
might help with us hearing. Is it okay? Okay. Yeah, if you can keep it as close as you, to you as possible. Chris Rosehart. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Nice to see everybody here. I'm a little nervous, but that's me. Um, I'm Chris Rosehart, and I'm Chrissy from Chrissy's Corner Store on Tulsa Avenue. Um, I have managed a small business there successfully for 45 years. Uh, I came to this country from Belgium with my parents, who came here for a better life after the, four, after the First World War, or the Second World War, sorry. So we have done great, and thanks to my parents for hard working and taught us how to work hard. We came from a tobacco farm, so anybody here would know what that's like seven days a week. So um, all while raising my family as a single parent, with my upbringing and personal life experience, I can associate very well with many of our local residents and taxpayers who day to day are just living on the edge. Being in business for these last few years have shown me how people struggle every day with their kids coming in, what are they going to buy, what are they gonna spend their money on, what comes first, the bread, the meat, they have to have gas in their car to get to work. I hear the frustrations. I hear their days going to work trying to find a babysitter or trying to find someone to watch your kids after school. The cost is so high. How are they going to get to work? How are they going to get home? Thank God we have a bus. People are starting to use it. They're learning how to use it. Some days it doesn't get them where they want to be at a certain time, but they're working with it, which is very good for our town. So somehow we need to manage to keep that. This is the third time around for Tilsmer trying to keep a bus system. 30 seconds. If the government funds us with more money and not just the tax dollars. Uh, why am I putting my name forward again for candidate for council? I strongly believe that our town will focus on, we must totally focus on getting new industrial jobs in our town. We must focus on most, much improvement management of our tax dollars, Ten seconds. your tax dollars. We must attention to be focused on all our town day-to-day -to -day duties. We must focus on much needed improvement and maintenance of all our town assets, making sure that each and every asset is utilized to a max to reduce our overall capital expenditures. A stitch in time stays nine. We know we have to keep our buildings up to date. Thank done? you. Oh. <laughs> Marcel Rosehart. Hi, my name is Marcel Rosehart, and yes, I am Chrissy's son. Uh, you can imagine the conversation that took place when I decided to run. <laughs> Uh, I was uh, born and raised here in Tilsonburg, uh, worked at the same business that she managed for a great deal of my uh, younger years, went off to London and tried to be bigger and better and all that stuff and came back to where my heart always is, here in Tilsonburg. We have a great community. Uh, I want to sit on council and uh, join in the other councillors in making our community better. Are there lots of issues? There sure are. Um, lots that have been brought up tonight, lots that are, we're going to go through in the next four years. That's absolutely true. Um, is there change? We are in the middle of change. Nobody can run from it. We can't hide behind it. It's happening. We need to soften that change for our residents. Keep in mind that we still need parks and walkways and all that stuff. And yes, there's more traffic. We came out of COVID and all of a sudden all the shops were open and people were driving around again. We just didn't know we had grown that much until we started seeing more vehicles on the road, more trucks coming to town. It is what it is. We need to help it. We need to control it to some degree. Yes, we need healthcare. There's lots of need for healthcare. The practitioners are going to help the situation if we can get them here. It's not a perfect seconds. solution. I'm here to work with everybody, all of you, not just one area of Tilsonburg. Everybody impacts the entire community. Everything we do changes everything. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> Kelly Spencer. Hi, my name is Kelly Spencer. I'm a lifelong resident of Tilsonburg, a business owner and a wellness author and positive community advocate. I volunteered, sat on several committees, countless organizations, sports and groups, and I've been involved with Big Brothers Big Sisters for the last 20 years as an in-school mentor and then a big sister and now a corporate sponsor. 
My parents taught me to do as they did, to give back to what you love, by doing what you can to create a positive support for the organizations and the people in the community as a community member. I've always been in the field of wellness. I was a registered nurse for decades. I worked at Tilsonburg Hospital, Children's Hospital, and in community nursing until I opened a wellness center in 2011. I'm a wellness column uh, writer for Post Media, Media. You may have seen my articles in the paper. I'm a mindset coach and a specialist, and I've worked with uh, several local schools, businesses, organizations all over Oxford County. I've even worked with the provincial government. Um, I've worked as a um, helping um, these organizations and groups to create optimistic environments for better solution finding and functioning, um, and therefore more productivity and contentment for the individual and the professional, and therefore the entire group. I've worked with the local fire department, uh, hospitals, Ingersoll, uh, Tilsonburg, and beyond, seconds. and the Oxford County paramedics uh, based on my book, Life and Self-Leadership. As a business owner and entrepreneur, I'm accustomed to idea making, to change and successful pivoting. I understand the concept of budgeting and making decisions of priority. I think this town has so many wonderful things about Ten it. Seconds. And I look forward to uh, being a council member. I'm 100% confident if elected, I can help this town continue to move and expand in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you. Cedric. Good evening. I love this town. I always have. I'm Cedric Tomiko, and tonight we've been given the opportunity to highlight to you the values surrounding our platform and to have you decide on a council that will lead our community for the next four years. Today I find myself well positioned with the knowledge and experience to serve our great community at a higher level and lead us into the next phase of growth with perseverance, dedication, transparency, and accountability. My life consists of being a husband, a proud father, business owner, a kinsman, a shriner, and a volunteer on many committees, committees serving and supporting our town. Being also a de developer, concerns such as overdevelopment and protection of green space have been brought up and been top items during this campaign, and I couldn't agree more. Being a father of two young girls and seeing them enjoy our parks and green space has given me much insight of how important it is to balance our growth with recreational infrastructure so that dreams like my girls returning to this community and raising their own children can become a reality. Developers, council, and town collaboratively need to take the responsibility with an open-minded and balanced approach to protect the overall quality of life of our great community. Balancing our growth to include the necessary healthcare facilities, more recreational opportunities, and yet maintaining the beauty of our town from the lake to the parks and trails, sports paths, and our beautiful town town. I'm open-minded here to listen 30 seconds. and readily available to fully understand not only the concerns, but also the creative suggestions this community has to offer. Combining that with my current experience and understanding of our town positions me well to serve you as counselor here in Tilsonburg. I love this town and where we are going. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Mary Ann Van Gertrude. Good evening. Excuse me. Did you hear me? Can you hear me? It's fine. Let's try. All right. Let me. There we go. Excuse me again. How are we doing? Better? Not better? Maybe you're going to have it as close to you as possible and then speak as loud as possible. <laughs> Thank you. Here we go. Here we go. Okay. There we go. I can hear it. Good evening, Mr. Kochev, candidates and guests. This is an exciting time for residents of Tilsonburg and how your vote for me will be of benefit to you in the, hearing your voice at council. Town hall and council operate best when you have representation that reflects the values of the community. Being a contributing member of the downtown Tilsonburg BIA demonstrates the hard work done to ensure the heart of our community is well maintained today and for the future. Being a volunteer for many years has taught me the value of community service. This valuable experience was gained by being involved with several baseball organizations for 20 plus years, 
serving several terms as chair of the Tilsonburg Molleteer of the Month Award, participating on special awards committee, and so forth. Recently, I've contributed and coordinated barbecues at 53 Queen Street for the seniors like myself residing at our not-for-profit residence. And my leadership skills have been a life learning experience where my career in facilitating group job finding clubs for over 10 years started. Working hard with positive support helped this client group serve success and achieve it. This success impacted the stakeholders in providing continued program funding. My commitment to you will always be willingness to listen carefully to the feedback, to understand the issues facing Tilsonburg, and being focused on you, the residents. My late husband, Sam Lamb, was respectfully known as a people's seconds. man, served 19 years as our town councillor, and mentored me. I will advocate for the positive actions, projects, investments that will build a Tilsonburg we are all proud of. And we do need to invest in our assets and services to meet the challenges of a growing population. I possess Ten the seconds. skills and qualities of working hard, being diligent, including being a competent, engaged team member. Thank you, everyone, for this opportunity while taking your time to listen to me. Thank you very much, everyone. So we have the, the same question that we posed to the mayors from the chamber. Um, our business community has told us that strong leadership is imperative for a growing town like Tilsonburg, and that leaders should work towards a sustainable vision for Tilsonburg. The question is, please describe your leadership style and how you would demonstrate leadership if elected to a councillor position in Tilsonburg. We're going to start at the, the far end in reverse alphabetical order. Certainly. Just bear with me. Um, sorry, I'm just needing a moment to prepare here. I apologize. Okay. First of all, I'd like to address leadership styles. I use some autocratic modules in teaching. And with that, that has been a proven record in the federal system. Okay, thank you, thank you. I have used the autocratic system in several positions where clients have come back to say, yes, this policy does work, and this I'm impressed. So we do need that at certain times in our positions for specific outcomes, especially funding purposes. Then also, I also have been a participatory um, leadership style in, of use. And that is having group participation put in their network of ideas, and networking is part of that. So keeping the mindset open for options, ideas, and creativity is also relevant in, in this. And also looking at another style, which is transformational. And that sometimes has a good advantage. And sometimes I've, I've used that in 2005 as being a co-chair for organizing the 2005 Canadian National Baseball Championship here. We had obstacles in-house um, and in community as not having enough um, hotel arrangements. But we went ahead and secured uh, facilities of uh, roomings uh, potentials in communities lying close to us. So we overcame what obstacles were there, looking at the positives of outcomes, and it worked well. So those were minor details, but coordinating that took a full year of dedicated team participation, teams working at different levels of fundraising, providing food, doing a barbecue, having a dance and a social, um, getting organized um, umpires, having schedules for things to work on time. So those are part of different techniques that can be used, but I always like being involved and engaged with people. I'm diligent in what I do, and I'm not afraid of hard work, as I've started my, my life as the eldest of three daughters, to parents who were tobacco farmers. So seconds. that's um, work and being diligent and being engaged with others is part of my scenario. And thank you, everyone.
Thank you. Cedric? Having a focus and empowering the team, having great passion, being a visionary, and finally taking accountability no matter what the circumstances. These are all ways I currently lead and plan to lead for the rest of my life. Currently, we own and passionately operate five different corporations. Those corporations have a vast array of team members ranging from wildly different de demographics. But if there is one thing consistent with the hundreds of people we currently lead, it is their response to positive encouragement and empowerment. First and foremost is the language used. Using the word team over staff has been key to empower our people and allow them to claim new territory. We also have changed the way we answer the phone from how can I help you to I can help you. That confidence of working as a team and knowing that someone always has your back is a game changer. In the professional coaching program I've done for 10 years, we have a code, that code being made up of 14 empowering statements. Statements 12 states, we all fall, but pick each other up. It's about standing together. Having that belief that another team member will always be there to help you through those moments of weakness or that off day we've all experienced creates a culture internally that is so tremendously valuable to a corporation's success, it needs to be a top priority to leadership. Vision is definitely a passion I've developed over the years. Having great mentors and business coaches around me that highlighted the importance of good vision and how effective it can be. Every year, my team and family create dream boards we hang over our desks and in our rooms. Those dream boards have been pretty full and had some pretty wild things on them over the years, but there is something tangible about putting a dream or a vision on a board and looking at it every day. Something that no matter how big the dream or how out there it may have seemed at the time, still comes true. As kids, dreaming was easy to us, second nature really, almost like breathing. But somewhere along the line of growing up, getting jobs, getting married, having kids, and doing that thing we all call life, we, some of us have lost that ability. Thankfully for me, my toolkit is full to ensure I never lose the childlike ability to dream. Casting vision is the same, and when you are well-versed in doing this for yourself and your team with a passion I spoke of earlier, you can lead this for any organization you feel like a team member of. Accountability is again a skill that needed to be learned over the years. I would say 20 years ago, I was that guy that had a passion misaligned, and that no matter what the circumstances, I could always point uh, fault in another direction. Years of coaching and mentoring has led me to completely opposite end seconds. of the spectrum. And now I tend to take accountability for an issue that's had or has nothing to even do with me. If I'm part of that team and we're in it together, then true leadership steps in front of the situation and claims responsibility. This is the type of accountability that should and can be taken, or should and can Ten be seconds. taken from council and the town of Tilsonburg team moving forward. There is too much opportunity and way too much at stake here to not make these core fundamental traits of effective leadership. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Kelly? Has anybody seen the TV show Ted Lasso? If you haven't, I highly recommend it. It's an American football coach taking on the job as a European soccer team coach. But he has challenges. Despite it, he is thoughtful, he is straightforward, and he is direct. He makes these tough decisions for the greater good of his team, but he does so with consideration and respect. He inspires those around him to be the best they can be, and he never underestimates himself. That's his superpower. He believes in himself, and I believe the world needs more Ted Lassos. Recently, I met Ernie Hardiman, the longest running MPP in Oxford County, 27 years. I was humbly introduced to him as a leader in our community and a candidate for council. He asked me what kind of leader I wanted to be or what I was. Through the conversation, we realized that he had worked with my father, Jim Spencer, who was president at Tilsonburg Hospital about 20 years ago. He said that some leaders wor worked with an iron fist. They were bullies. They got what they wanted, my way or the highway. And it would work for a little while, but then people wouldn't like them, and therefore the overall efficacy and success was limited. 
Um, he said that uh, my dad was a listener. He involved everybody in the process. He treated everyone with respect. He was a team player and therefore greater success and people liked him. He said that I sounded like I shared a similar leadership style to my late father. He also said that my father was the kind of leader that could tell people to go to hell and he'd enjoy the trip, or they'd actually enjoy the trip getting there. <laughs> Personally and professionally, I attempt to lead by example and accountability, consider differences with compassion, and face challenges calmly and effectively with critical thinking, confidence, and vision to find positive solutions while collaborating with others. Since the day I, uh, my kids were born, I have looked through their lens. I have wanted to create a world where when they look out at it, they are happy. I have, have been involved a lot in community and events, fundraising organizations over the year and years, and I love this town, and I believe in the proverb of it takes a village. An entire community of people to provide and interact positively within the community experience to grow a safe and healthy environment for all the people in the town, despite differences of education, social status, economical status, religion, politics, race, orientation, age or otherwise. Myself and my business, business have been blessed with uh, several recognition awards. Lately, or recently, Tourism Oxford gave us the Responsible Tourism Award for collaboration with local businesses and local farmers, environmental consciousness, and diversity. I believe in myself, and I believe in this community, and I'm ready to lead and be a part of the positive change for this Ten incredible seconds. town. Thank you. Marcel. Leadership style. Well, I am an aggressive individual, so I have always been that way. But I have been talking to everyone, everyone. And communication is key in any leadership role. You have to be able to talk to everyone. So the person that has a small concern that the plow came by and ripped the grass off my land, or to the guy who says, you know, they're blowing the stop sign three times a day as they go through my community. These are all important things. So you have to listen to everybody. And then you have to take that information and go back to council and be willing to have the argument there and be willing to be convinced otherwise. So as the other five counselors sit there and talk to you about what they've heard and what they've talked about, and you have to sit there and go, yeah, you know what? I understand exactly what you're saying, and you're right, and that's the way we should do things. These are all of some of the things that I'm capable of doing. I ran a business through our last little episode over the last couple years, and I'm still here. That's a big deal. There are a lot of businesses that didn't make that transition who were incapable of making changes and listening to what's going on. I was able to do it, along with a lot of other people that are sitting up here on this stage. But how many people weren't able to do that? Weren't able to listen, weren't able to take criticism, weren't able to take that person that walked through the door and goes, hey, I, I get what you're trying to do, but this is what I need. These are all things that I am able to do. I can talk to people and talk, and we can let's sit down and talk again and go back to the conversation a week later and say, hey, this is what I've heard and, and I need to tell you this. Because you're not always gonna agree with everything that we do. So I'm not going to be a pushover. I'm not going to be that guy. I'm going to stand up for who I am. I'm gonna stand up for the people that are voting me in and for the Tilsonburg residents, which is a big deal. Because at county level and at the provincial level, we're not always listened to. We need to stand up, and several times, if we have to wave the flag, the Tilsonburg flag, and go, hey, here we are, we're still here, we still need help, we need money, we need time, we need to have the conversation, that's something that we all need to do. And that's what I'm willing to do, is stand there and do have those conversations. 30 seconds. That's it, thank you. Chris Rosart. Thank you. Hi. Um, in my business, I still have an old phone hanging on my wall. People comment on that. I don't have an answering machine. When my phone rings, I answer it. I'm there at 5.30 in the morning, because that's when the people are going to work. 
to people that need someone to be open. And I'll tell you, it was not easy keeping that business open through the whole fan pandemic. It was difficult, but the people were there. They supported it. They came in, they thanked us, all kinds. It was wonderful. The knowledge that I got from them and how they were trying to survive the pandemic as well. It was wonderful that I could be there and that I'm still there. And I hope I'm still there another five years from now. Hopefully, there will be. My vision and your vision, we can take nothing for granted. Nothing, we all have to work together. Your tax dollars, sometimes we have to be careful what we wish for and ask for, because it's our tax dollars that are gonna pay for it. You wanna keep your taxes down? We all have to contribute and do a little bit more for ourselves and for the other community and the people around us. It's, it's gonna be hard, it's not gonna be easy. Always be conscious, sorry. Always be conscious of how each and every tax dollar is being spent. That is something that bothers me most of all sitting up there, because I have to pay taxes as a business. I'm afraid, I am not afraid of challenges. I'm not afraid to say no. I'm not afraid to ask questions. I'm not afraid to pick up the phone and call somebody. And if somebody calls me, I'm not afraid to go to their property and see what's going on. I think that's important. I can't see it on a computer. I need to talk to someone. I need to see it. I need to hear what they have to say, what their concern is. Teamwork, everybody talks about teamwork. We need teamwork. That is the most important. Each counselor needs to talk to each other. We need to verify what we're thinking and what we're saying. We need to help each other out to make sure that we're moving this town forward in the best way we can. I'm always approachable. I'm always there day or night. If I'm not, I will get back to you. Judgment, I don't judge anybody because we're all out there trying to accomplish the same thing. I'm a good communicator. I deal with all kinds of nationality of people in my business and they're wonderful and very knowledgeable. I keep people informed and I'm a voice for you. Thank you. Bob, I am a trans <coughs> excuse me, I'm a transformational leader. Transformational leadership includes a focus on the future, a focus on change and a focus on people. Focus on the future. I will use my vote on council to ensure strategic planning measures satisfy Tilsonburg's future needs and reduce our exposure to risk. How? Budgeting ahead of our current needs, a minimum two-year operating budget and a minimum 10-year operating budget, and continual updating of our asset management program in order to avoid, avoid surprises like the Kinsman Bridge. Focus on change. I am an agent of change. With such rapid growth we've experienced and likely more to come, change is inevitable. I want to examine our community's current and requested services to strategically prioritize services based on needs and not wants, and to look for efficiencies in the, in the methods programs are delivered. How? I want to examine potential savings through the delivery of shared services and programs with our neighboring municipalities. I want to find new solutions to, off, to offer needed community programs and supports that we could otherwise not afford. Uh, for example, during my campaign, I have learned there's a genuine uh, need to support families in crisis whose loved ones are suffering from mental illness, addiction, and even homelessness. To remedy this, we, need to, we are going to require sustainable, long-term funding through new partnerships. Focus on people. I want our corporation to be known as a workplace of excellence and I will use my voice to, uh, on council to support this initiative. I believe we need to retain and reward high performing employees who would, will adapt to council approved initiatives and who are eager to serve our ratepayers. I want to find a better way for town council to engage and connect with all citizens by using readily, readily available technology to implement easy to navigate website so that the public can quickly find the topics of discussion and debate in advance of upcoming uh, council meetings. 
so as to facilitate much more public participation and to communicate council decisions in a timely fashion. As a transformational leader, seconds. I will work to inspire my council colleagues and our employees to collectively achieve more than they ever thought possible by tapping into everyone's individual needs. If we're all rowing in the same direction, our municipality can't help but be successful. Thank you. Chris? Leadership comes in many forms and can change depending on the situation that you're presented. As a counselor, you are unable to fit into just one leadership style, as there are many different situations that present themselves. To me, the leadership that a, council can a counselor can bring, including myself, and I think I do it on a regular basis, is through open and transparent communication to the residents, being engaged and showing care and compassion when it comes to resident concerns, bringing new and fresh ideas and challenging the idea of status quo. Also, ensuring that a reasonable budget and business plan that addresses the needs of the community is passed. Quality decision making is another form of leadership when it comes to being a counselor. I have confidence in all of the decisions that I have made in my first term of council, and when making decisions, my focus is keeping residents' concerns in mind, while consistently developing solutions that have a positive impact on the community. I will ensure that I maintain these decision-making qualities for upcoming priority projects for the town, such as multi-year budgeting, safety decisions, and the Kinsman Pedestrian Bridge, as well as the Community Center redesign. Open and transparent communication is one of the biggest points of my leadership. I ensure that I am always engaged with the community, both on social media and in person. Over the last four years, I've proved this. There are a number of different ways that I've shown care and compassion for the residents of Tilsonburg, and a few examples of those are um, in Hickory Hills, when community safety concerns such as speeding and traffic concerns on Wilson Ave were brought forward to me. I went and sat with the residents of Hickory Hills to collaborate and come up with ideas on what we could do to mitigate the concerns that they had. From there, I seconded a motion to have the community safety zone created, which increased fines and reduced the speed limit on Wilson Ave. Further, when employees of Maple Manor brought forward safety concerns at the intersection outside of their facility. I went and discussed the concerns with them, and I also moved a motion to have a four-way stop created. A responsible budget and business plan is something that I've really focused on throughout my first term of council. In the 2022 budget alone, I brought forward eight resolutions to add or remove items from the budget and business plan. This included funding for the creation of a youth council, which will focus on youth engagement and bring ideas forward from the youth of our community. This will also work to develop the future municipal leaders of our community. And to finish, leadership comes in many forms from decision making, handling resident concerns with compassion, being approachable, and being a problem solver to the challenges that our community faces. It is also challenging the status quo and making sure that we're comfortable or making decisions seconds. that we aren't necessarily comfortable with. I feel that I have demonstrated all of these forms of leadership over the last four years and want to continue to show my leadership abilities. Thank you. B. Luciani. Well, I know what uh, my leadership style isn't, and that is autocratic. That is in spite of being a police officer for most of my life. I've always based decisions on evidence and based my decisions on what is shown to be the best solution. I work well with other people and value their input. I would rather be listening than speaking. We often have varying opinions and topics, and it is all input that requires consideration. Being able to accept others' opinions, reports, and studies are necessary as no one is an expert in all things. One thing that I was surprised about, though, is the amount of studies we undertake. Uh, there were at least a dozen in the last few years. Thankfully, staff have managed to complete many with external grant money. For those of us without the requisite knowledge that the report is directed at, we need to pay attention to these when making our decisions. Going forward, we have current in-depth reports on many areas to assist the next council in decision making. If elected, I will continue being well prepared for meetings, paying attention to the staff reports, the external studies and stakeholder interest, and applying common sense to decisions. Respect and consideration for town staff, committee members, and anyone I interact with is always present. My past four years as a councillor is evident of this. Good leadership means trying to deliver upon what the community wants in our 2021 10-year community strategic plan is a document that is the guide to this. 
time management is also a good leadership skill. And on that note, I now end. Thank you. <laughs> Michael? Hi. One thing I'm going to add to what I've written, to put a campaign together, you have to be a leader. I think it's fantastic that there's 13 people at this table fighting for six positions. I think it's fantastic that 13 people are actually vying for these six positions, two mayors before that. And everybody at this table is showing leadership qualities, the fact that we're sitting here talking to y'all. But if one is a leader, you simply do what needs to be asked to be done. I'm the president of the Thunder and have been for 15 years. A strong leader does not do everything himself. I have a strong general manager, coaching and training staff, excellent volunteers, which have produced a strong championship team. True leadership builds a team of skilled people and lets them, lets them perform. You have to let people mess up and then work with them to understand how to fix it and not mess up the same way again. If any of you were at the hockey team last time, we had that discussion with a number of our defensemen. And I'm also really with my time. Thank you. Barbara? Leadership skills. I want to tell you a little bit of a story about leadership skills, and I want to acknowledge the community of Tilsonburg. I moved here, I bought uh, 38 Rideout Street, um, the Mance, uh, 2019, and the month after I had purchased the place, the pandemic hit. So I want to acknowledge the town of Tilsonburg, the leadership of skills, because you all had it. I'm still open. I'm still open, you've acknowledged me. Another leadership uh, skill I had is when I was in London, Ontario, I actually up, I up, uprooted my children, five of them at the time. I, I'm a mother of seven children, 16 grandchildren. And I uprooted five of my children. I, I actually put us into a low income area because I wanted to, I wanted to um, uh, show the low income area leadership skills. But I want, so I ended up in one of the low income areas in there and I became a president, but I wanted to, I wanted to change those children um, in, in that area. Again, the leadership skills, but I needed help to do that. So I needed something that these children liked, which was a sport. It was baseball. So what did I do with the baseball? I actually went to the police station in London and asked the police officers if they would volunteer their time to be coaches for these children. I went to the Blue Jays. I asked them if they would sponsor these children uh, so I could create a baseball team throughout all the low-income areas. In, in, in London. Um, the leadership skill was great. I had Burger King involved, I had McDonald's involved. We ended up, we ended up creating a baseball team. And the way the kids got on these baseball team was not because they could hit a ball or they could get a home run. It was because they had to go to the police station every Saturday between two and four, and they had to watch um, movies of, of, of b and uh, abuse to l &Es. They had to watch these movies, and that's how they got on that team. So we did create this team, and each low income area created this, we created this team, and at the end of the season, uh, the teams that won, um, the Blue Jays had transported them to Toronto, and they got to see the game, and they got signatures um, from the Blue Jays. So then Toronto actually uh, seen what we were doing, and now they uh, do the, did the low income, and they competed together. So it was a back and forth thing with the, uh, the um, I called it the Rookie League. And today, from what I'm told, the Rookie League is still seconds. going in London. So that's a really good leadership role. That's who I am. I will take something and try to solve it and put a good thing to it. Um, I love it when people, I'm very positive. I love it when people uh, have a smile on their face when they're sad, you know. I will, uh, I just, anyways, um, I could go on and on and I've Ten got seconds. many stories I could tell what I've done in the communities. Thank you. Dave? Kelly brought something up a few minutes ago about Ted Lasso. There was a line in there in that program that said, don't take an umbrella to a brainstorming session. <laughs> and think about that. How many of us do? We have to be open-minded, especially when we're on municipal council. During my entire career, I've uh, been in a leadership role. I've been self-employed all my life, owning my own business, and uh, with my help of my family, of course. I have monitored, I have uh, delegated, I have trained many employees in customer service. Uh, during my time on council, my direction has always been proactive. 
uh, private agendas can spell disaster, and I've never been accused of being self-serving. When you treat people with respect, you get respect in return. Something that we have to realize, municipal, municipalities have one form of taxation, and that's property tax. Other levels of government collect gas tax, income tax, corporate tax, tobacco and alcohol tax, and HST, as well as some other taxes. And these dollars were all yours in the first place, and mine. We must elect a council who are experienced in knowing how to make application to have these tax dollars returned to Tilsonburg. Networking is what I do well. Networking takes time and it takes dedication. It takes many years. And when you achieve your networking goals, it opens up doors. One thing for certain, the future is uncertain. At the time of the last election sitting here, not one candidate discussed the possibility of a worldwide health pandemic. And guess what? We do not know what might happen in the next four years, but between surviving in business and changes at the town and in the world, I've learned to be open-minded and to expect the unexpected and to deal with it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Cindy Allen. What is my leadership style? If you are referring to Kurt Lewin's leadership styles, my style is participative leadership, the most democratic style of leadership. I would offer guidance, but also value input from other members of our community, like all of you sitting here tonight and those watching us from home. I want the community to feel like we, like they have a say in things and that there is a meaningful connection to our council members. I have demonstrated my leadership abilities over the last four years by accepting leadership roles within the town as the chair of accessibility and the vice chair of transit. When I was nominated as chair of accessibility advisory committee, there was no document to audit our facilities for accessibility. My solution, was I read hundreds of pages of AODA and I created one. So in, in 2019 and just before the pandemic hit in 2020, we made a subcommittee and went around and audited all of our town facilities and parking lots. I have 90% completed an audit for outdoor spaces that focuses on parks, trails and playgrounds. These documents were shared with the Oxford Joint Accessibility Advisory Committee. The goal is to standardize our audits in the county so there is, a, there is a consistent accessibility standard. On transit, I was nominated as vice chair. When we started our term, we had a call and ride system in town and no inner community transit. Now we have a fixed route system in town that services on average 800 people a month. Our highest was 932 people in March of of this year. During COVID, we launched our inner community transit bus route that can take you to London, Ingersoll, Woodstock, Delhi, Norwich, Langton, and the beach at Fort Burwell. Transit is also starting to plan a Stuff the Bus campaign for the Helping Hand Food Bank for December. If you want to be involved with this, please send me an email at cindy.allen19 at gmail.com. In 2018, I showed leadership and determination as I created and presented a delegation to council to get deficiencies on our street fixed. My amazing neighbors all pitched in and I was the leader who presented in front of council and met with senior management after the delegation. I am a team builder who does not pretend to know all the answers and that is why working as a team is so important. I will be looking for collaborations and new ideas to make our community better. My sustainable vision for Tilsonburg is that we need to build our re reputation about being open for business, business and having leaders on our council that are like me, able to use leadership skills to benefit Tilsonburg. I would continue to be, Ten seconds. to be a proven leader like I am now when elected to council. That is why a vote for Cindy Allen is a vote for putting unity back in our community. Thank you. Max Adam. Thank you, Michael. I'd like to apologize for the length of my opening remarks. I thought I had an additional minute, but I'm not running for mayor, so. Um, anyways, regarding uh, ro my role as a teacher, what I was trying to say a little bit earlier was just that through those experiences teaching those young people, I've developed some more patience, open-mindedness, acceptance, and understanding. Um, so 
to answer the question about leadership, both personally and, or sorry, to describe my leadership style, I would say it's a cross between a visionary leader and a transformational leader. Some words I would use to describe uh, my characteristics would be bold, encouraging, innovative, inspirational, open-minded, optimistic, persistent, respectful, and strategic. Both personally and politically, goal setting is something that is important to me, as well as uh, associated performance indicators. So our community strate strategic plan has those. Uh, and as such, from a government's perspective, I am committed to striking a balance somewhere between the community strategic plan and the town's budget and business plans. To get back to the topic of leadership styles, I just want to give some concrete examples of being a visionary and transformational leader. Um, so before becoming a teacher and uh, a politician, I was a program coordinator for a local uh, community support service agency. Um, there was uh, some examples of reducing red, ta red tape, making it easier to volunteer, just uh, less expectations. Like the expectation was, you know, we had to go a couple times a week or do it once a week. And so we were accepting uh, of volunteers who were able to provide a little bit of time a bit less often. Uh, there was a couple new Meals on Wheels routes developed in, uh, in the Tri-County area. So we had one here in Tilsonburg and Norwich, and that was expanded to Otterville and Straffordville just because there's a need there for seniors with a uh, meal provisions. I was also coordinator for volunteer transportation. Uh, the total drives we offered seniors to medical appointments and uh, social outings increased 100% uh, from 2,000 drives to just about 4,000 drives uh, per year. There was a funding application filled out which brought the first uh, accessible transportation van to Tilsonburg through that position as well. Uh, previously, taxi companies had provided it, but there was no ride for the underprivileged, and so that van is still in operation. Maybe not the exact same van, but the service, I should say. Um, and then with fundraising too, I was involved with that. Uh, we held several dances right in this uh, in this facility, and uh, my background in the entertainment industry helped with that, raising uh, approximately ten thousand dollars over seconds. three events. And lastly, just uh, some work that I I did on the Woodstock and Area Community. Uh, health Center Board. It was uh, now known as the Oxford Community Health Center, and uh, I was advocating for bringing services to town. Some of those services do exist Ten now. Seconds. And lastly, my involvement with the Tigo Transit. I was uh, there with the current mayor in the planning stages as an informal committee, and it is now uh, materialized, and it's good to see that. Thank you. Thank you. So we're sitting at about 8.20, and I know there's 13 of you, and I'm proposing a change, and that can be controversial. And um, Do we want to try and do audience with it being 8.20, or do we want to stick to the script? Does anybody have any thoughts up there? <laughs> yes? Yeah, I think the next question is a lot of what has been said over and over again. Um, I, I propose opening it to the, to the floor, and I think that's a great idea, and engage this community that came out tonight. Are people comfortable with that up here? Right. Yeah? I'm good okay. with that. Okay. Michael, well, what we could do is yeah. we could uh, give our script to you, and you could post them on the, uh, the website. Yeah, on the yeah, Chamber of Commerce we website. Could, people could read it at their leisure. Would we could try and figure out something like that, but right. we're, we're losing some people and we want to hear from you, so the mic's here. <laughs> and now no one's going to have any questions. <laughs> Motion to adjourn. <laughs> I'm uh, new to Tilsonburg. I've been here for five years. And all the other municipalities I've lived in, the councillors were ward councillors, not the entire town or village or city councillors. So my question to you, it's very hard for me to figure out out of 13, who's the best to pick? Because you have different people that live with, close to your neighborhood that are running up here. And I'm wondering if your next election or your next council could study 
looking into creating a ward representation. Thank you. That might be a hard one to answer. My, Michael, I was also going to propose in certain questions if maybe not everybody has to go, like if people want to pass her, but we yep. could touch yep. on it. Like I, I'm comfortable touching on this to start it, the conversation. So the question is whether or not we should have ward representation as opposed to representation um, each councillor for the whole community. Right. And then split it into separate portions. Yeah. You can go ahead. Okay. So uh, with each term of council, I think this is uh, reviewed. It was uh, during 2014, 2018. Uh, for historically, from what I understand, the ward system, or sorry, the uh, at-large system has worked here in Tilsonburg. There hasn't been too much uh, brought up from, brought forward from the community to suggest changes. But uh, I, I think I answered this in another questionnaire or at another debate, but uh, or it was a question at another debate. But I think uh, myself, and I can't speak for others, but certainly open-minded to a, a ward system, but until that conversation's kind of started from the from the community, I, I wouldn't anticipate any any changes. Okay, thank you. Anything on that one? <laughs> so there's pros and cons to having a ward system. Um, some of the pros are if, for instance, both Max and I work in live in the same neighborhood, so we would be going against each other, so that may affect some people's decisions because we are in the same neighborhood. The other um, things that could be a pro is that you would be able to quantify what a councillor actually is doing in, in your um, town. So there's pros and cons, definitely worth a conversation if most people are looking to start that discussion. I'm opposed to a ward system simply because this town is not geographically spread out in larger areas that does require a ward system. If we were spread out in a much greater area, what, what a ward system can cause is uh, grievances between territories. So if I have a bridge in my neighborhood, I have to trade with that person for a, a new arena in their neighborhood. And, and right now we work for the betterment of the entire community because we're, we are a small geographical area. I'm opposed to a ward system. Any comments on that question? No? Michael, did you have anything to say? I actually got this question at the Baldwin Place um, meeting. Uh, they, they basically have brought up the proper points. You could have the two good people working in the same ward, so therefore you would lose one, but you're closer to the ward. So then again, Dave brought up some, some good points too. So it's really up to the people whether you go to a ward system or at large. I, I'm okay with either. Pete, anything to say about that? I don't know whether I'm going to add anything to the conversation that hasn't already been said. Uh, my, myself, personally, I think that uh, as it's working is good. I hate to see that uh, you would have an, an election and possibly have, like, we've got 13 people up here. There's some very good candidates, and if we're doing it ward-wise, we may have, say, four for one ward and only one for another ward, which would eliminate possibly some better people being elected in certain wards. So. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I would be open to a review of possibly moving to the ward system um, because there are pros and cons to it. One, it actually cuts down on nimbyism um, because councillors don't have to protect uh, against decisions um, that affect the vote as an overall where they're just uh, defending in their, their ward system. You can also measure the amount of work that a councillor does in a ward system. However, myself, I thoroughly enjoy representing the whole community and being responsible and being able to react and, and communicate with all residents of Tilsonburg. So it would have to be a, a big sell, but it is something that I would be open to reviewing. I concur with Councillor Bears and Luciani. Thank you. Go ahead. How are you? Well, I've sat on there and I've brought it forward before, I think about six, seven, eight years ago. And at that time, our community was not large enough for a ward system. So I think now maybe re-looking and visiting it, it's hard to say, but you know what? You're the taxpayer, you're the people, and if whatever you want, that's what this council will do. Thank you, or I will do, thank you. Marcel? So a ward system in Tilsonburg would be an interesting perspective, right? Um, because you really have to break down the voting numbers. So if you're in an area, where you have a very low voting rate, 
which some areas in Tilsonburg do, and there are other areas that have an extremely high voting rate. So as a person going out and trying to get votes, I would go to an area that has a very high voting rate and hopefully convince those people that I would be a great counselor. You know, I don't necessarily need to go to areas that have, let's say, for argument's sakes, a 10% voting rate, where another area in town has over 70% voting rate. Why would any of those people want a ward system? They wouldn't. They have a lot more control over council in voting when they're the ones that are making the decisions. They're the ones that are putting us in the seats. And we're all aware of that. All of us sitting up here are aware of what areas in Tilsonburg have a higher voting rate than others. So it makes no sense whatsoever at this point for us to have a ward system. Kelly? Um, of course, I'd be open to looking at the data of the benefits of it, but any leader of any organization knows that it's a cast of thousands. And so when we go to a ward system, and I don't think geographically, like they said, there's just not enough space for it. Norwich and those areas, it's, it's vast, so it makes sense. But the more people you can have bringing their you know, diverse thoughts and individuality together to create solutions for the town, in my opinion, is better for the town. Right now, you can get anywhere in town in 10 minutes, so it's not very vast to go into that sort of system, in my opinion. Thank you. Cedric? Uh, I too concur with, uh, now we got four of us, I think, Parsons, Luciani, and Bears. Uh, that being said, though, I would be open-minded to a proper study done on this. Um, I, I feel like there's, there's a, a lot that circles this topic, and, and I think that having the proper people uh, doing proper assessments and looking into all angles of this, like I, I in you know, the two minutes or three minutes that we have here to actually think about that question, it's hard to look at every vantage point. So I would definitely be open-minded enough to look at a review and see what would come out of that. Uh, but I'm leaning more towards, uh, I don't think it's a fantastic idea, no. Marianne? I do concur that at this point it's something to look at, but we're not ready for, but we can prepare for it when we are ready. But keep that in mind. We are not grown to, this, to the population or demographics of a ward system. And as a, we may need to look at that at a future time, but keep that open for that future within the next four to five years. That's what I conclude at. Thank you. Other questions? Don't be. I have nowhere to be, so. <laughs> I have three kids to put to bed, so. everybody so what why don't we um, start at the we have a question coming forward yeah. good evening uh, potential uh, good evening um, I represent a uh, service business in town and uh, and I hear a lot of uh, concerns from my customers as they sit while their vehicles are being serviced about uh, what, is your, what is the plan for uh, the routing of traffic behind Baldwin Place <coughs> in the event that uh, a new subdivision is put forth. Uh, I'm surprised it doesn't come up here tonight because it's the number one thing that I hear in my workplace. So I'm just curious on uh, what the thoughts are for that. So if, if you couldn't hear, there's a, a Baldwin Place uh, development proposed um, adjacent to Baldwin Place um, for the future. And there's a question about um, the traffic and uh, other impacts of that and how the various candidates uh, feel about that. We start at the far end there with Marianne. Certainly. I believe a study uh, with 
results with the OPP and the consultation with the traffic board needs to come together and assess professionally with stats and a options options for that issue. It is an upcoming issue, but we do need to plan it ahead to prepare for this. We all know that the subdivisions are expanding and growing, and we are growing territorially. So that needs to be done with the professional level of the OPP consultants, as well as our own Transportation Board Committee. Thank you. Thank you. Cedric? In discussion with the residents of Baldwin, uh, there was, and, and with the developer of, let's call it Baldwin One, at one time there was a Baldwin Two that was proposed for <coughs> in behind the existing Baldwin place. Um, that proposition was basically shot down due to uh, the land developer just not being able to make a land deal with the current developer. The existing residences of Baldwin Place would have less concern with the traffic if the traffic was, say, associated to a Baldwin Two, a phase two of Baldwin Place. So the way that I see um, assisting with this concern and presenting a viable solution is somehow negotiating a plan through the land developer, allowing them to develop that land, but yet keeping it separate from the remaining three quarters that would exist beyond what is behind Baldwin Place. A Baldwin II would keep the residents of Baldwin Place uh, happy. You could do the land development in a way where it would include uh, possibly an additional rec center for them or things along those uh, lines. But negotiating a solution with both the land developer and the existing developer, I think, is what's necessary here to alleviate those concerns uh, with traffic and, and basically splitting up the two developments, keeping one somewhat private from the other. Thank you. Kelly? Um, with speaking with um, residents at Baldwin Place, the concern um, for those of you that might not be aware, and I don't know all the developmental plans, um, is that the new subdivision won't be a Baldwin II, but a young family community, and that the street's access will go through Baldwin Place. I, I validate those concerns that many moved to this town to a retirement community thinking it would be staying that way. And to change the rules of the game halfway through the game is very frustrating. So I would really advocate for looking at development in another way that would go out to other areas like Concession or Pressy um, that would not include being right through the Baldwin place. Thank you. Marcel? I, <laughs> so are those so-called, and this is just off the cuff, I mean, they're talking about 1,200 homes, right, to go behind Baldwin. So if that's one person per vehicle, are we talking a 1,000 cars coming off of that property? We're not just talking about Baldwin here. We're talking about Quarter Line, Concession, North Street, Pressy Line, um, everything, everything that feeds up to quarter line into Baldwin is going to take that traffic. So yes, is Baldwin going to have somewhat of an issue if we can't solve some of it? Sure, but at the same time, we're also dumping all those cars out onto quarter line or out onto Hawkins concession, whatever you want to refer to it as, and then down concession or up quarter line to North Street, or are they working here in our community? Are they staying here in our community? Which way do they go to work? You know, so there's a lot more at stake than just what's going on in Baldwin Place. I get their concern, I do. And we need to look at it, absolutely. But there needs to be a big picture look at it. And as a perfect example, all of you know about the four-way stop they put at Washington and Grand, right? 
So that stop sign by Maple Manor, right, that they put in there, that four-way stop, actually diverted traffic onto Ralph Street because Ralph Street has absolutely no stop signs except for the one in front of the hospital. So when we do these kind of things and we instantly change one particular spot, we are moving traffic, diverting it. We're changing the way people are coming in and out of our community. So yes, Baldwin has concern, but so should the rest of Tilson. The Westfield School that's on quarter line, the pathway that runs from Hickory Hills over up into Baldwin Place. All these things are going to be part of what has to happen. It can't be just the one thing. It has to be the whole picture. Chris? Hi, folks. Once this plan comes to us, which it hasn't, we haven't received it yet, there's a lot of knowledge, a lot of talk. We don't know until it comes to us. But yes, the traffic will be phenomenal. On Quarter Town Line, on Concession Street, all those streets are going to be innovated with traffic. And it's, um, how, how are we going to work with it? As a councillor, we're really going to have to take a look at that really close. And we know that we're going to have to somehow work with the subdivider and the planner, whoever's doing those homes, how we're going to divert the traffic so it doesn't influence everything onto Baldwin Streets, or sorry, Baldwin Place. Thank you. Bob? Candidate, uh, candidate Spencer uh, said it best in my view. Uh, I would only add that uh, I am concerned as well about the traffic on at the intersection of Esseltine and Quarter Town Line by Westfield School. That's not going to be good. And also, I live at Baldwin and Quarter Line, and I can Quarter Town Line. I can tell you, there's there's already way too much traffic there in my view. It's really busy, and uh, so uh, I'm concerned about that. And more importantly, uh, the residents of Baldwin Place should have an awful lot to say. They should have their input heard. And that's my comments. Thank you, Chris. Yes, uh, thank you uh, for the question, uh, John. Uh, the, um, the plan is actually not being made public. It hasn't been brought to council, so we've seen no information about the plan that's proposed. However, as I spoke about earlier today, we need to minimize the impacts on the neighboring communities when we're developing. We need to make sure that we don't have issues like Hickory Hills, who's faced um, major traffic increases and in speeding um, through their neighborhood with the development that happened in Andrews Crossing. Um, um, so there, there's a number of ways that we can do this. There's traffic mitigation. I know when the, the plan comes forward um, to council, there will be a traffic study that's provided. From there, council has to make decisions as to what they want to see. So it's not minimizing the, the problem that's there right now. It's that we haven't seen the plan. They, they have done a lot of work, and they have said that they will be coming to council to present this, to present their concerns, which will definitely come into the decision-making process as the report and the plan for the subdivision come forward. So we just need to make sure that we're focusing on minimizing the impacts of new development on current existing developments. Thank you. Heat. I'm not too sure much how much we can keep adding to this, but uh, I will say that I agree with uh, both Chris's and Marcel. Um, there's some very valid points. Um, the, the key one here is that, yes, traffic is not only going to affect one area, it's going to affect the entire town. Right now, Oxford County is doing a master transportation study for the, for the entire county. We, as Tilsonburg, also had a transportation study uh, on our budget. Uh, it didn't go through at this point in time, and it will likely be reintroduced in the next budget. But a Tilsonburg transportation plan also looks at development, it looks at uh, vehicular traffic, it looks at, at other methods to move around town, and it comes up with the best way of doing it. And as Chris uh, mentioned, there would be a traffic study uh, as part of that subdivision as well. So. I think uh, until more facts are available, it's pretty hard to, to give you a definitive comment. Thank you. Michael? One of the problems of being this far down the table is that pretty much everything that's been said has been said. But I'm going to go back a little bit of history. I remember going across the Kinsman Bridge before it was a Kinsman Bridge as a little guy. That at that time, Hickory Hills and Baldwin Place were all tobacco fields. When Hickory Hills was going to be built, everybody was against it. All these new houses are going to come in. But they came in, they became part of our community, 
and it's grown from there. Then Baldwin Place is going to come in. And everybody from Hickory Hills was against that because Baldwin Place, all these new houses are going to get, going to come in. But you know, they came in. There's some traffic issues, and we're dealing with them, and we're studying certain areas and getting them fixed. Now we have another development that's coming past Baldwin Place, and it's the same thing again. There is traffic studies out there. Somebody from Baldwin actually um, sent that to me and talking about what they really don't want is traffic. And that makes sense. So do we have an extra line going out to Cressy Line? Do we put stop signs or tra traffic lights? For example, on um, Baldwin, Baldwin Street and Wilson, there needs to be a light there to slow people down so people can, can get out from there. These are all things we need to study. And do we stop progress in Tilsonburg? I don't think so. But, but do we figure out a way to keep Tilsonburg a small town but allowing it to become a bigger town. Thank you. Barbara? Yeah, everybody has said basically everything. It, the trafficking is very, very important. Um, I don't know a lot about this. I haven't done a lot of research on it. I've done a lot of listening. Um, my, more fo my focus more is on um, affordable housing right now, but um, I do agree with the trafficking. I mean. I go downtown and the traffic's horrendous down there. I can just imagine the traffic that comes in over there. Yeah, so again, everybody has said everything that we could possibly do and move forward and just wait until final paperwork comes out on it. Thank you. Dave? I am opposed to the site plan as it has been presented. The um, site plan has not been through council, and when the site plan does come to council, there's several areas of opportunity to make changes to the site plan. Uh, traffic is certainly one of them, and that certainly will be reviewed. But no, I'll, I'll go on record. I'm not in favor of the site plan as presented. I agree with the concerns that the Baldwin residents have brought up. It's not just their safety when they're trying to back out of their driveways because they may need a couple extra seconds of extra time. And also we have to look at the safety of the Westfield students as well. So however we decide to route our traffic, which we need a plan before we put in a scale like this, because the traffic on Quarter Town Line is horrible. I'm up on the north end and we have a lot of problems because there's nowhere for people to go. So if we put in a big scale like that, we need to make sure we have arteries, make sure our, our lanes are widened, and that we're doing things that are going to make sense for the traffic flow to mitigate some of these problems. Max? Well, I currently have a blueprint on my computer about a, uh, for uh, flying cars, so that's gonna help mitigate some of the traffic issues. <laughs> Of course I'm joking, but uh, I've not seen the site plan uh, as of yet. Uh, as Councillor Parker already mentioned, there'll be a pl uh, the plan will come forward to Council and for comment, community concerns at that time. Uh, the only thing I wanted to point out is that I have a track record of promoting community and road safety. Um, it was my notice of motions that uh, put four-way stops at two locations along Quarter Town Line. Uh, I also proposed designating the main road at Hickory Hills, Wilson, a community safety safety zone. That was a few years before it actually happened. It didn't have the support at that time. Um, and lastly, just having supported the PXO pedestrian crossings. There was a concern brought up earlier today about uh, the relative safety of them or whether it's the right, the right model. I think uh, there was a good answer for that at another meeting in Hickory Hills, I believe it was, and one of the mayoral candidates, they mentioned that we now have the infrastructure there in the right spot. So hopefully for those community crossings and then things can always change and would it, would it be nice to get things done uh, you know the first time right more cost efficient yes but at least we have the uh, the infrastructure there and that changes changes can be made so I I'm sure that that'll get uh, uh, altered at a later date thank you so we're sitting here at about 850 almost so we can move to our closing statements at this point in time unless there's any Burning questions out there? Uh, I don't have a question, more of a, a cautionary note. As someone who's used truck routes from coast to coast between Canada and the US, you could clearly see those that were thought out and those who the people in charge decided to sacrifice the neighborhood 
to deal with a problem. I would constantly encourage you to please not think of it as, well, it's not in my neighborhood, so I don't care. Because somebody's got to live where all those trucks are going 24 hours a day. And Mr. Luciani, I believe once a policeman, always a policeman. I'm sorry to hear about those two officers that were taken. Thank you. Why don't we, we move to the closing statements? Um, so we're going to start at the, the end with Mary Ann, and you've got uh, one minute set aside for this. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank the Chamber of Commerce and all residents and our council team up here who are all candidates uh, vying for the position. I'm very thankful for this opportunity and have uh, faith in being uh, honest, being available, being um, diligent in hard work to all members of the community, working together, team networking, and um, being engaged. That, those are important things in my, in my personal value system. We'll just say this seconds. has been an awesome experience, and thank you for the experience, everyone, and vote Marianne Van Gertrude when you come to vote, and vote. Take that responsibility very heartily. Thank you. Cedric? So it looks like we got about a quarter of the room, so these are the diehards, apparently. <laughs> Want to hear every last word. Um, I didn't prepare closing remarks, because I just wanted it to be true and be a part of what the reflection of tonight. So I think everything's been said, and, uh, and the decision is yours. This council is going to lead our town for the next four years, and there's some, some big, big opportunities coming our way, and I think we need to make sure that we have the right people seated Perfect. in the right positions to navigate those opportunities. If you want to hear more about me tomorrow night, I have a meet and greet, 6 to 9, in my office. Feel free to come out. Thank you, and have a great evening. <laughs> Kelly? A community is only as strong as the ties that bind it, and the relationships therein must therefore be healthy for the community to remain healthy. Community wellness can be anywhere from financial prosperity, or access to affordable childcare and everything in between. I think, as Chris Parker had mentioned, I think we need a youth council uh, committee at ages 15 to 25. I think the progressive uh, opinions of our youth is important right now, as well as the DEIJ committee, diversity, equity, and uh, justice. 30 seconds. I look forward to bringing my experiences to the table, collaborating with you, collaborating with the council, uh, the chamber, as a council member for the town, thank you for coming tonight. Thank you for being the diehards. Thank you to Suzanne and the Chamber of Commerce. Thank you. So, uh, again, yes, thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, it means that you're not only here to listen to us, but tomorrow or the next day, you are actually going to go out and vote, which is probably the most important thing. Right, and not just about the people in this room, but the rest of our community. We have a pretty bad voting rate, so I believe it was 31% last election. So that is a big deal. So all those out in TV land, please pick up uh, your phone or pick up your iPad or walk in and go and vote. Seconds. And since you're doing it, put your mark beside Marcel. Thank you. <laughs> Chris? Hi, thanks everybody for coming out. Thank you for allowing me to be here, stand in the chamber. I appreciate the time that I'm allowed to come here. I'm hoping after 24 years of being on council that I've done the town well and served the community and I'd like to do it for another four years. I have lots of energy. I'm in the public every day. I'd like to serve you some more and I'd appreciate your vote on the March, well, sorry, Sorry, <laughs> October 24th, but I prefer y'all start tomorrow because we need to get this done. Thank you. Um, to, help, to, excuse me, to help ease the cost of living pressures, people are feeling right now in the grocery store and at the gas pump. My goal is to ensure Tilsonburg has one of the lowest property taxes in any town our size in Ontario. I will work for you to ensure your tax dollars are being invested efficiently and with expected returns and outcomes. This is my application to work for you. 
Given my semi-retirement status, I am in the fortunate position to have time to serve you well, to be your first choice, your go-to counselor. I invite you to contact me anytime to share your ideas or discuss your concerns. It would be a great privilege if I were selected to serve our wonderful community as your town councillor. Your vote would be an honour for me. Thank you. Thank you for saying a word. Chris? First off, thank you all for attending tonight, uh, and thanks again to the Chamber of Commerce for hosting this event. There's been a number of great ideas brought forward tonight, and going forward, there's a lot of work for the next council to accomplish um, to continue to improve the municipality. My main areas of focus over the next four years will be community safety, traffic, development impacts, and youth engagement, along with continuing my work with affordable housing and possible health care solutions. Over the last four years, my leadership, dedication, communication, engagement, and professionalism, as well as the seconds. care for the community has shone through. The position of counselor is really all about all of you. I want the opportunity to represent the people of Tilsonburg as we work towards continual improvement and managing the sustainable growth. I will continue to bring new and fresh ideas forward. Over the next 11 days when casting your vote, please vote to re-elect Chris Parker. I've enjoyed my last four years on council and I believe the town has done well. Our future focus needs to closely follow the recently completed 10-year community strategic plan. It contains priorities set by council, town staff, and most importantly, citizen and resident input. It also incorporates a vast majority of issues discussed here tonight. Quoting the vision from the strategic plan, our vision for Tilsonburg is to grow a vibrant and engaged community built on partnerships and entrepreneurial spirit. The vision includes diverse housing, employment options, seconds. modern amenities, and a sustainable growth that remains true to our cultural, culture and heritage and positions of communities as a regional center. It is about quality of life and finding a balance for all of our residents, including our newest ones. My agenda is to support this. My experience, positive attitude, and availability of time as a retiree supports my, commi my commitment if elected for this next term. Thank you. Okay. I believe Tilsonburg is a great place to live, which is why I chose to live here, raise my family here, and have a business in this town. I heard a speech a couple weeks ago that I've tried to achieve in every business, charity, or activity that I've been involved with, and I'm going to borrow what we'll maybe steal it, actually. I may not be able to make everything in Tilsonburg perfect, but I will make it better. Thank you and good night. Okay. There are many other issues and concerns, and I would love to be part of all, of all those issues and concerns to try to solve them. I'm actually a real, very good um, solver, and um, I, won't, I won't sit down and get stepped on by a carpet. Um, if, I get, um, if I get on council, I look forward to hearing about all concerns, goals, objectives, and values. Then take action to pre present and um, pursuing in the, for the future. So my little statement that I have, it's, it's the work of the community and teams that... 30 seconds. Oh, determine the... I don't got my glasses on. Can I believe this? I don't have my glasses on. Determine the uh, future of the success. Thank you. Every term of council should always have new blood should also have new, new people and new ideas. However, it is important to have some continuity. It's your responsibility to elect a council with both qualities. Let me be the voice of history and continuity. Hopefully I've proven my commitment throughout the years to Tilsonburg, and with your vote, I'll continue with an open mind for Tilsonburg's future. Thank you. Well, I'm hoping to be the new blood on council, but we need a diversity of strengths and abilities when electing our next council. I have experience and knowledge that can help guide our community through our social issues and sustainable growth. I am a strong community advocate that only wants to serve our amazing town as town councillor. For more information, check out my YouTube channel. It's not great, I'm not a YouTube star, but it has information on it. Search Cindy Allen for Tilsonburg Town Councillor for more information. And remember, starting tomorrow, vote Cindy Allen as one of your town councillors. Thank you. Max? 
Thank you. Closing remarks, if elected, I just want to say I pledge to continue, continue to be communicative to the public, both in person and online, to demonstrate solid decision making in the role. Um, one plank that's been the same for me always, always is fighting for lower, lower taxes. One counselor is one vote, but from 2014 to 2018, tax increases were both reasonable and uh, limited at between one and two and a half percent per year. Um, affordable housing is another topic that keeps coming up. I have some ideas ideas with in terms of slight intensification in the downtown areas or other acceptable areas. Uh, and lastly, probably one of the ones I'm most passionate about is, is uh, getting more Tilsonburgers and lo or local people access to doctors. So I've uh, led or helped lead some big movements before, and that would be one way that I'd want to uh, make Tilsonburg a better community. Well, thank you to our to our candidates up here and for all of you for coming out tonight. If you want to watch again, it's on Rogers multiple times. Um, get out there and vote. And, and thank you all for coming. Have a great night. Due to the length of the preceding program, we now join the regularly scheduled program already in progress. ...for them and we help facilitate tree plantings on their school grounds. Um, a new one we're starting to do a bit more of is stormwater pond plantings. So mm -hmm. stormwater ponds are those big retention ponds that you see in the newer subdivisions. Um, and they play a really important purpose for our city. They hold the water. They um, help filter water, especially storm waters that pull up on our roads and on our driveways and they store it and they slowly release it back into the groundwater. Um, and so we're doing a lot more naturalizations of those stormwater ponds so that they're not just barren grass that um, pollutants can pull up on. And when you say naturalizations, do you just mean kind of just tree planting? Um, and is it like you try and aim for native species, right? Yes, so we only plant native trees and shrubs because they are what has grown here and has done the best in our region. Um, but there are other organizations like LEN, LEN Environmental Network, who do similar naturalizations as well, but they focus more on pollinator gardens and rain gardens. And together, we're just doing little pockets here and there, but slowly we're naturalizing, hopefully, a lot of London. I think sometimes people forget that after you plant a tree, you still kind of have to care for it. And I know you guys have an aftercare program. Can you tell us a bit about it? Yeah, so aftercare, it's a little bit more relaxed than our typical tree planting events. And we invite all people of all ages and experience to come out and help manage and take care of the sites that we've planted in the past. So we.